Please sign in, please. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? We will have quorum in just a minute, Mayor Patterson. Yes, Mayor Patterson, we have quorum. Okay, first up is Committee of the Whole closed meeting. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Council resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole closed meeting to consider the following items. A, Labor Relations or Employee Negotiations, IATSE Settlement. B, Labor Relations or Employee Negotiations, IBEW Negotiations. C, Labor Relations or Employee Negotiations, KPFFA Negotiations. And D, Litigation or Potential Litigation, including matters before administrative tribunals affecting the municipality or local board, and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose, Ontario Municipal Board Appeal, 48A Point St. Mark Drive. <clears throat> Please vote. And that carries. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju wacheya kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in a committee of the whole closed meeting. We discussed uh, several items related to labor uh, relations, uh, and we also discussed the Ontario Municipal Board Appeal for 48A Point St. Mark Drive. So I will ask for a motion to waive our procedural rules and ask that the clerk report, please. Moved by Councillor Hall and seconded by Councillor Hutchison that council rise from the Committee of the Whole close meeting and that the rules of bylaw number 2010-1 be waived and the clerk report. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland, that Council ratify the collective agreement and authorize the Mayor and Clerk to execute the agreement between the Corporation of the City of Kingston and the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, Moving Picture Technicians, Artists, and Allied Crafts of the United States, its territories, and Canada, IATSE, Local 471, for the period January 1, 2017 to December 31, 2019. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Boehm, that Council direct staff to prohibit a public provide a public report at the November 21st, 2017 Council meeting to inform the community of the status of the applications for an amendment to the official plan and zoning bylaw for the lands located at 48A Point St. Mark Drive by Homestead Land Holdings Limited, as well as Council's direction as it relates to the Ontario Municipal Board pre-hearing scheduled for November 22nd, 2017. Please vote.
and that carries. This is a reporting out from the October 3rd, 2017 closed meeting, moved by Councillor Schell, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that the Chief Administrative Officer be delegated signing authority to enter into an agency agreement with Queen's University to allow the city to submit planning applications on the approximately 50 acres of vacant employment land at 945 Princess Street, owned by Queen's University. Councillor Holland, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to declare conflict on this item. Thanks. I'm Mary Reed Holland of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston. Declare my pecuniary interest in this matter as I'm employed by Queen's University. Councillor Cannon. Thank you, and through you, um, I'd like to declare a conflict on this. Um, I did in the previous meeting uh, at a different time in the meeting, but uh, uh, as I'm a licensed realtor, I'd like to declare a conflict on this, but haven't had a chance to do so this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so we will call the vote, please. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, moving on to approval of the adeds, we have an amendment to a presentation. We have a report from the nominations advisory committee, and then we have uh, several communications. Can I have a mover for the adeds, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you. Please vote. And that carries. Thank you. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Councillor George. Thank you, through your worship. I, Kevin George, of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, uh, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 1, Report Number 109, as my company has been uh, hired by the applicant.
Thank you, uh, Councillor Candon. Thank you and through you, I, Adam Candon of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number 109 as I am a licensed realtor. Thank you, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm Mayor Rita Holland of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston. Declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 2, Report 107, as I am the owner of an adjacent property. Okay, thank you, Councillor McLaren. Thank you, I, Jeff McLaren of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause Number 1, Report 108, in that I am a volunteer at the subject institution. Okay, thank you. Are there any other declarations of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, then we will move to uh, presentations. We have a couple of presentations this evening first. Uh, I have the privilege of presenting life-saving awards to uh, three recipients, uh, Olivia Giovanetti, Mark Levine, and Hannah Reddy. I'm just going to move over to the podium just for, for a moment. Early on the morning of January the 27th, 2017, Queen's First Aid Medical First Responders, Olivia Giovanetti, Mark Levine, and Hannah Reddy responded to a casualty on Queen's campus. The responders assessed the casualty and recognized an allergic reaction, which was quickly developing into severe anaphylactic shock. The responders contacted emergency medical services and administered an EpiPen. With paramedics en route, the responders administered oxygen, assessed the effectiveness of the EpiPen, and monitored the casualty's vital signs. An ambulance arrived shortly after the administration of the EpiPen and transferred the casualty to Kingston General Hospital for treatment, where the casualty recovered. Olivia, Mark, and Hannah are to be commended for their knowledge and use of first aid in saving a life. So at this point, I'm going to ask if Olivia, Mark, and Hannah would join me up at the front, please. Okay, thank you. And moving on then to presentation number two, uh, Jan McDonald, Senior Projects Manager, Marketing, Downtown Kingston, BIA, and Barry Keefe will present Council with a frame set of the limited edition 2016 Pewter Collection and announce the 2017 Pewter Collection. Thank you, Your Worship and Council, for welcoming us here and to uh, people who are here tonight. Um, uh, my name is Barry Keefe, and I'm here because of uh, uh, my connection with the Downtown Kingston Board in the past and as a Secretary of the Business Improvement Area, but also as a past President of the Frontenac Foundation. Um, 24 years ago, uh, Downtown Kingston decided to implement a, a one of the many programs that they have, and this year we're proud to announce the um, 24th collection of uh, limited edition collector prints. Each holiday season, five of the uh, significant buildings in our city um, are well known for, as landmarks and we want to recognize those. So they're selected by a, a committee and created as pewter ornaments. Uh, it's a chance to celebrate the wide array of uh, properties in the city and this program has been and continuous, continues to be tremendously popular. Um, if you go into the shops downtown, you probably know already that uh, if you purchase $20 worth of uh, uh, anything, really, um, 
then you get a, a credit to go towards the pewter ornament. So it becomes a very uh, inexpensive and well well received uh, item in a Christmas Christmas time. Um, expert opinions are always uh, coupled with local input, uh, and we ask people to submit uh, some of the buildings. And as you can imagine, five items each year uh, over 24 years, the list is quite extensive. So uh, my colleague Jan Vistel McDonald is going to introduce them. Thank you, Barry. So this year's collection will be launched next Monday, which is November the 13th, and there will be one ornament released every Monday until the final one on December 11th. So without further ado, here's this year's collection. The first to be released next Monday is known as the Bishop's House. You may not be familiar with that name, but it act, it's actually the west part of the Frontenac Public Library, the limestone building that faces onto Bagot Street. And initial, originally it was called the Bishop's House or Parish House. Secondly, we're celebrating classic video, an institution in downtown Kingston and a beautiful building. And it is uh, celebrating 30 years in business this year. Next will be an institution in downtown Kingston as well, but much longer than classic video, A1 Clothing, which has been there for well over 70 years and is a lovely stone building on the corner of Princess and King. Fourth, uh, celebrating, it seems to be a lot of anniversaries this year, 100 years, the Cataraqui Golf and Country Club. It's the first time we've done a club, but I think uh, the golf club is worthy of recognition as an ornament. And finally, for the second time only in 24 years, we're actually bringing back an ornament. Uh, sentimental favorite of mine and probably other people's is KCBI. For obvious reasons, it celebrated 225 years and it doesn't have much longer as a school, so we're happy to bring that one back. As Barry mentioned, ornaments will be available for just $10. Once you've purchased $25 worth of something downtown, that could be your groceries, your dentist, all of your Christmas shopping, whatever you feel like doing downtown. Three locations, the Visitor Information Centre across the street, the box office at the Rogers K Rock Centre, and the box office at the Grand Theatre. So, in celebration of the wonderful history and architecture possessed in our city, as well as the continued support given, us to, given to us by the Mayor and Kingston's Council, we're pleased to present a framed set of the 2016 limited edition Pewter Collectibles. Okay, thank you very much. So at this point, we will move on to uh, delegations. We have several delegations on our agenda. First up, we have Don Amos, Executive Director, the Seniors Association, Kingston Region, who will appear before Council to speak to Clause 1 of Report 108, received from the CAO with respect to the Seniors Association, Kingston Region Amendment to the Lease Agreement. And I'll just uh, give this reminder to all of our delegations tonight uh, that you have five minutes to speak. Good evening, Your Worship and Councillors, and thank you for this opportunity to uh, present to you about the Seniors Association. I'm here tonight to ask for help by way of loan forgiveness from the City of Kingston so that the Seniors Association can allocate that monthly payment towards our operations to further enhance our programs and services. Let me explain. The association is based on four key pillars and when working with, when working with the older adult population. First, provide opportunities for physical activity. Second, provide opportunities to stimulate the mind. Third, provide opportunities for socialization. And fourth, provide nutritious food. Research has shown these four pillars provide older adults with a high quality of life and help them to continue to live independently in their own homes for as long as possible. With that in mind, the Senior Centre on Francis Street has had record numbers this past year with 106,172 visits to the center. This does not include our 17 special events or our 14 monthly evening rentals. The Senior Center is truly a community hub of activity from the time we open the doors at the building at 8.30 in the morning until we lock up at 10 o'clock at night. On any given day, you will see children, youth, adults, and older adults enjoying the facility. 
Why do we need our loan forgiven? We took a benchmark of 2006 and started as our starting point, and we ran a correlation with our memberships to the older adult population. As you can see, the association is staying ahead of the curve for members and adults aged 65 and older in the Kingston region. However, the city of Kingston is projecting that by 2025, the older adult population will increase by 50%. As further data, the Southeast Local Health Integrated Network, or the Southeast LINS, data center shows. Of the 15 LINS in the province of Ontario, the Southeast LINS has the oldest population. The largest city in the Southeast LINS is Kingston. With this data, we are expecting a large growth to our membership. To date, we are on pace to have 722 new members by the end of this calendar year. To accommodate this growth, we need further funding. I put this next slide up to show you the Senior Centre is very diverse in its revenue streams. And thus, I do not ask, I do not ask for help. Uh, however, we need an injection of support from the city. Forgiveness of the existing loan will assist us in strategically positioning ourselves to offer a platform of programs and services that can be delivered effectively and efficiently to the older adult population of Kingston. We are already expanding our services rapidly to match the population growth of the older adult community. In 2014, we opened Senior, Centers West, Senior Center West, utilizing the space with the Boys and Girls Club at the Frontenac Mall. In 2017, we opened Senior Center Loyalist, once again utilizing space that has been renovated, this time at Edith Rankin Memorial United Church. And in 2018, we'll be opening Senior Center North in the Rideau Heights Community Center. We're reaching further into neighborhoods to have greater accessibility. Our resources, our resources are very thin, and forgiveness of the loan will assist greatly as we assist the city in a strategic loan, sorry, strategic goal of a livable city for all. On behalf of the staff and board of directors, thank you for the consideration of our request. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to our next delegation. Susan Duchar, resident, will appear before council to speak to the deferred motion number one with respect to naloxone. Hi everyone, uh, I'll start by saying I applaud uh, the people who were awarded, um, uh, who were awarded for um, uh, saving a life with an EpiPen. I'm angry, kudos to you, but I'm angry that I have to stand here and ask for another life-saving tool. I'm angry that I have to demand support. I'm angry because this is all down to stigma. This comes down to stigma. Every single last bit of this comes down to stigma. Not one of you would question a defibrillator or a Band-Aid or an EpiPen. Or if you were standing by a frozen lake, you would jump to save a person drowning. And yet I'm here having to demand and beg for your support for another life-saving tool to save the lives of a substance user. And substance users, again, it comes down to stigma. There is not one single face to a substance user. It, it does not discriminate. It affects professionals, nurses, doctors, lawyers, teachers, students. It affects people in lower socioeconomic backgrounds. It affects people in higher economic backgrounds. 
So I'm angry. I'm angry because what you're telling me by your deferral and by your lack of action and your deafening silence is that the people who use substance, substances, their lives don't count, that they aren't worth saving. And I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed at, at all. We demand action, and naloxone is just one of many harm reduction tools in the harm reduction and drug strategy program. We will be fighting for others like safe injection sites, like alternative treatments, medical treatments, like heroin-assisted uh, treatment for substance users, like hydromorphone-assisted uh, treatment. This affects elderly people, government policy and decisions, bad decisions made by city, provincial, and federal government are actually creating new demographics that are taking to the streets for their medication. Chronic pain patients are taking to the streets because their doses have been, have been stupidly uh, uh, um, cut in half. Devin, my son Devin, his life counted. His life counted. And I'm really loath to say that he went to KCVI. And before he went to KCVI, he was asked to attend the International Baccalaureate Program. He was a gifted, highly gifted student. He was also a highly gifted uh, musician. He was the kindest, most compassionate, generous person I, I have ever met. And I don't care if his, I'm his mother. I have people, other people telling me this. And his life counted. And he's dead. I can't help him anymore. I can't help him. But I will never recover from his death. And I won't recover from anybody else's death in this community. I fight for them because they still have a chance. And naloxone is a harm reduction, a life-saving tool that will give them a chance to find recovery because the long wait times, the lack of funding, all of it comes down to stigma. So choose wisely. Take your stigmatized glasses off, take your perceived, perceived views, and put them elsewhere of stigma, of, of Ma'am, thir 30 addiction. seconds. 30 seconds. And vote wisely and humanely. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, we will move on to our third delegation this evening, Grant Curry, president of Local 417, Ontario Public Service Employees Union, will appear before council to speak to new motion number two with respect to equitable college education. Thank you, Your Worship and, and Councillors. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, we've got, uh, I, I stand here before you representing the, uh, the hundreds of uh, faculty, both contract, sessional, part-time and full-time faculty. The full-time and partial load contract are those that are on strike, but we represent all the faculty at St. Lawrence College. The hundreds of faculty that teach at uh, Kingston, Brockville, and Cornwall. 77% uh, of those faculty at St. Lawrence College are what we call contract faculty who work on short-term four-month contracts who are paid less than the, the lucky ones like myself who are full-time faculty. That is the, the sum and substance and the most important issue that we are on strike for right now. It is a, the concept of equal pay for equal work and non-precarious jobs, jobs that faculty can rely on, that they can build a life on. It's impossible for these contract faculty 
to plan their lives around a four-month contract. So I come to you now, uh, now it is more important than ever uh, with the recent move in, in contract negotiations that we didn't see when this motion was foot, first put forward. But today, uh, yesterday, the, uh, the council put a forced <coughs> offer vote that uh, places the school year for the, the, the thousands of students that attend St. Lawrence College, the many hundreds of international students that have moved here to get their education at St. Lawrence College, it's put it in jeopardy. And we need your voice to support uh, the, the bargaining process to continue, uh, to resolve quickly, and so that we can have a good collective agreement that will address the issues of, of our contract faculty and get the students back in the classrooms where they belong. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other delegations to... So, so I, I, I've let this go because I think that there's uh, definitely was a, a very good presentation we heard earlier tonight. But I, I do have to enforce the rules of council chambers. I am gonna ask for no further applause uh, while we were making decisions. But thank you for your enthusiasm, support, and interest in, in the issues we are talking about tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, are there any other delegations to add tonight? Yes, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, I'm moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Holland, that uh, bylaw 2010 1, clause 11.4 and 11.5 be waived to add a delegation. Miss Amy Van Black to speak to the deferred motion number one with respect to naloxone, please. Okay, please vote. So this is to add Amy Van Vleck. I know, the wording's wrong, but as long as everyone under, as long as everyone around the table knows what we're voting for. And that carries. Deputy Mayor Neal. And I believe the clerks have both of the delegations that I've requested, uh, including the one that was just on the board. Uh, for Colin Bailey, to, sp to speak to motion three on, uh, on bike uh, boulevards. Just so we're clear, because I used the wrong one before, I'm going to use the opposite wrong one this time. That's, that would make sense. So, so regardless of what you see on the screen, we're voting for Colin Bailey to speak to motion number three. Please vote. Waiting for one more. Is, is Councillor Candon signed out? We're going to end this vote and we will re-vote once again with the incorrect name showing. Apologies. Okay, please vote.
and that carries. Councillor Neal, Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, and there is one that's about to come up, I believe, for uh, Stefano Hollands, and again to speak to motion three. Councillor Neal, could you confirm your seconder, please? Who's your seconder, Deputy Mayor Neal? Um, Seconded by Councillor Stroud. Stroud. Okay, thank you. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any other delegations to add? Last call. Okay, seeing none, then we will invite uh, Amy Van Vlack to speak to council with respect to deferred motion number one regarding naloxone. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Amy Van Vlack, and I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak tonight on the motion in support of naloxone kits. You may remember me. I was here a few months ago to talk to you about a motion in support of a woman who was facing racism. That night was incredible. You were all so compassionate and so supportive. I want to thank you for that. Tonight we will be talking about a different demographic, but I hope you show the same compassion and support as you did that night. I'm not here tonight to speak about stats or other facts about naloxin because I'm not an expert. But I am able to speak to you about why this motion is so important to me and other members of our community. I'm going to tell you something about myself and something I usually don't talk about because of the stigma surrounding it. I suffer from a chronic pain condition called fibromyalgia. And because of this, every day I have pain all over my body. I take four different medications for pain control on a daily basis. One of those medications is oxycodone acetaminophen, also known as Percocet. Percocet is an op op opioid and is very commonly used and highly prescribed. I am one of the faces of someone who is an opioid user. I know when we talk about the subject of overdosing, you likely have an image in your mind of the type of drug addict that you see on television or in the movies. What you don't see on television is the mother who has chronic pain and takes her pain medication so that she's able to take care of her children, or the addict who is someone's parent, cousin, brother, sister, or the teenager who has been struggling with mental health problems and doesn't know how to deal with it. I've lost my father, my uncle, and my grandfather to addictions. I have friends both estranged and current, but these are still my friends and family. I love them regardless of their addictions, and if any one of them overdosed in front of me or anybody else, I would expect that their lives would still be worth saving. If we can put resources into training for defibrillators and other first aid, why aren't we doing it for naloxone? We have experts available that can advise on the training that's needed, and we have the funds to put into whatever is necessary to make this happen. I know there is much more to preventing overdoses, and naloxone kits are just a drop in the bucket, but with the support available, there really is no excuse to not support this. There are countless numbers of people prescribed opioids every day. They are easily accessible and can pose a risk to anyone who has them. One of the things that needs to be talked about is having naloxone kits in our schools. This is incredibly important because of how, how easy opioids can be accessed. Children of all ages could get a hold of a variety. And having naloxone kits available to parents, teachers, and on our school buses could save lives of children. We cannot be naive about the fact that children have access to opioids. On November 2nd, newly elected leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, visited an overdose prevention site in Vancouver. He was trained to use a naloxone kit and is urging for more overdose prevention sites to be designated in Canada. He understands that this is a public health crisis. That is what a responsible government looks like. As elected officials, you have an obligation to make sure everyone in our community is safe. Nobody should be picking or choosing who gets to live or die. This is your opportunity to be a responsible government and to show that all community members are deserving of their lives being saved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Okay, seeing none, thank, thank you very you. much. Uh, at this point, we will invite so at this point, we will invite our next. 
So I, I am going to ask again. If we could please refrain from applause. Thank you. Our next delegation this evening is Colin Bailey, who will speak to council with respect to new motion number three about bike boulevards. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, welcome, councillors. Uh, so according to Kingston's official plan, Frontenac, Nelson, Alfred, and Albert Streets are designated as green streets in the area known as the Princess Street Corridor. As they provide an important visual and physical link between two of Kingston's largest urban parks, the Memorial Center and the Victoria Park. According to the official plan, green streets are defined as tree-lined corridors that create important visual links and enhance pedestrian cyclist connections between areas within and surrounding the Williamsville Main Street. This definition suggests that these streets are critical for supporting Kingston's goal of increasing active transportation, especially for those who live within five kilometers of their workplace. Given that in the most recent version of the Kingston's master transportation plan, uh, there are no proposed bike lanes, no proposed sidewalk or trail improvements, and only one signed route across the area defined in the Princess Street Corridor. Therefore, the proposed transportation plan is in inconsistent with Kingston's official plan, inconsistent with the Green Street designation for the Princess Street Corridor, and continues to prioritize on-street parking and car use. So why is a bike boulevard so important for the Williamsville area? I've been a resident of Kingston since 2012, and I've been living in Williamsville since 2014. And I've seen great improvements to both the Victoria Park as well as the Memorial Center, and more and more children and young people are using those parks. And if Kingston wants to be serious about increasing active transportation across the city, a bike boulevard is one way that we can get youth who oftentimes are, are not experienced bicyclists to be able to use a street for the purposes of getting from one destination to another. A bike boulevard will also align with Vision Zero uh, guidelines within Kingston because there is safety in numbers. As the number of pedestrians and bicyclists increase in one area, the number of per person accidents declines. And so especially for people who are inexperienced bicyclists, this is one way that we can improve active transportation and increase the share of active transportation that we have here in Kingston. And as well, uh, for the Williamsville area, with more and more students uh, moving to this area as well, um, it will be an important traffic route um, for the purposes of utility, connecting people to two major parks in Kingston and over to the university with little out of the direction travel, which is important for a bicycle boulevard as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for your presentation. You mentioned several streets that are already identified in the OP as green streets. Is, do you have any sense of which one of those streets might be more advantageous or more uh, appropriate as a bike boulevard? Absolutely. So in the uh, uh, official plan, uh, Frontenac Street is uh, designated as the priority street for a green street. Um, it represents a street with low traffic volume, which is also associated with increased pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Um, and therefore, Frontenac Street would be a great place uh, to start if there was a pilot project um, proposed for a bicycle boulevard. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. And our sixth and final delegation this evening, Stefano Holland will speak to council respect to new motion number three, Bike Boulevards. Good evening, Your Worship, City Councilors, staff, and guests. My name is Stefano Hollins, and I'm the Alma Mater Society's Commissioner of Municipal Affairs. Thank you for giving me the opportunity this evening to speak about the appropriateness of adopting a pilot program for Councillor Neal's Bike Boulevard proposal. Before I proceed with my comments on the macro level implications on planning, I would like to point out the clear, more obvious benefits for active transportation advocacy. Although the pilot program is set to cover only one street, 
It sends a message to permanent community members and students alike that Kingston is making a push to be a smart and livable 21st century city. Adding greater access to, ac to active transportation, which a bike boulevard aims to accomplish, can be touted as a demographic pull factor that will attract people to either come or to stay in our city. The associated financial costs of implementing bike boulevards must be recognized as a critical infrastructural investment that will help attract and retain talented labor. Mm -hmm. On a micro level, Queen's University students, the demographic I'm here to represent today, will also benefit from a bike boulevard. The vast majority of students do not have cars and rely on active transportation to reach almost any destination. In the absence of sidewalk salting in the university district, adding a designated bike boulevard will do much to reassure students that Kingston is dedicated to providing quality infrastructure for all of its residents. Simply put, testing out a bike boulevard is a tangible and sensical public policy intervention that will help bolster Kingston's image as a forward-thinking municipality. Bike boulevards are good for cyclists, they are good for local residents, they are good for the environment, and they are good for the city of Kingston. Furthermore, Councillor Neal's proposal for a bike boulevard pilot program is an important project that could have major implications for future urban planning in the city. Accordingly, adding an existing cycling lane to our current street space challenge us, challenges us to critically examine how we can use our streets within their current physical limita limitations to better serve human needs. The large width of Kingston streets represents an allocation of space that is largely inefficient and creates excessive underutilized concrete. Implementing a bike boulevard begs a question. Can we work within the confines of our current physical space to do more for residents? Adding a dedicated and barricaded bike lane would narrow the roads in which they are situated on. Narrowing car lanes serves an important function of slowing down vehicular traffic speed in residential neighborhoods while promoting greater act active transportation. This addition will make Frontenac Street safer for current residents and will make it a more unique, green, and enjoyable city to live in, or street to live on, rather. What should interest urban planners the most about this project is the wider precedent this may set for how we arrange and allocate the use of our streets. City planners can attempt to analyze how we can better incorporate active transportation into busier arterial roads. For example, we currently have excessive, excessively wide two-lane streets on Johnson Street and Brock Street that can be reimagined to more efficiently use the space that already exists. In doing so, the city of Kingston can eliminate havens for unsafe speeding and can increase the safety of cyclists by using parked cars and physical barricades to separate them from the road. The proposed bike boulevard on Frontenac Street can be a starting point to help examine the feasibility of transforming more streets into active transportation friendly zones. In closing, at a micro level, Queen's University students will be delivered a public policy inter intervention that accommodates their overwhelmingly high preference for active transportation. Additionally, if City Council is to vote in favor of this pilot program, it will renew its commitment to making Kingston a dynamic and progressive city that capitalizes on its greatest asset, which in my mind is its envied livability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, thank you. And at this point, we will now move on to briefings. Okay, so we have, we have one briefing tonight. Matthew Wilson, Senior Advisor of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario will provide a briefing with respect to AMO's What's Next Ontario Local Share Proposed Action Plan. So I'll invite Mr. Wilson up at this point. And uh, just while we do that, I'd also just like to acknowledge the, the presence of a couple of other elected officials that have joined us from a uh, neighboring Loyalist Township. Uh, Mayor Lowry and Deputy Mayor Breezy are also here uh, to listen to this briefing. So with that, Mr. Wilson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Your Worship and uh, members of council. <clears throat> Earlier this year, Lynn Dolan, the president of AMO and the deputy mayor of the town of Innisfil, announced a, a proposal to raise the HST by 1% to fund critical local services and infrastructure in communities across the province. 
<clears throat> this presentation will help you understand some of the basics behind the proposal. I'll talk a little bit about the process that led to it, why it is necessary, the alternatives, and how it would work. Let's start with the process. The subtitle you see on the screen, Imagining a Prosperous Future for Our Communities, represents what we have endeavored to do through the What's Next Ontario and Local Share process. What's Next Ontario is a project that we began in the spring of 2015, and it represents one of the most ambitious engagements this association has undertaken in the last 10 years. We thoroughly discussed financial issues with municipal leaders in dozens and dozens of meetings in all corners of the province, including several meetings in this uh, city hall. This process has included three specific phases. The first phase was to talk about some of the challenges that municipalities face individually and the fiscal realities that we all face together from one community to the next. The second phase explored what some of those solutions might be. And the third phase, which is where we are today, is to present the leading option to achieve sustainability, which has been unanimously endorsed by the Board of Directors of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. In terms of what guided this discussion, above all else, we needed to be strategic and forward-thinking in considering the options which would modernize the provincial municipal fiscal relationship for the long term. We needed to capture the diversity of municipalities across the province with flexible options that are accountable and transparent to the public. We had to consider options that represented good public and fiscal policy. We needed to be fair and equitable to the taxpayer, and above all else, we needed to come up with solutions that are sustainable for the long term for both orders of government. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? To deliver existing services and close the infrastructure gap, every year for the next 10 years, municipalities will need an additional $4.9 billion per year. That $4.9 billion is on top of inflationary increases to property taxes and user fees. It also assumes that all existing federal and provincial cost share programs and commitments are fulfilled over the next 10 years, including cost share programs and infrastructure. This is obviously a fairly substantial number when you look at it sector-wide. That means that we had to consider a broad range of options in order to close the gap. In total, we looked at 44 different options. We measured each against a standard set of criteria, including how much revenue each could generate, the impacts on specific geographic areas, and we boiled these down to one leading option. That leading option is a 1% municipal sales tax that would help fund critical local services like roads, bridges, and transit to help reduce the upward pressure on property tax bills and to diversify how we fund communities. A sales tax is used in other parts of the world to fund municipalities, including in 25 states south of the border. It is a well-respected and well-used tool. How does this idea line up against other leading options? Well, the first leading option is a property tax increase. If we use the property tax increase to close that $4.9 billion gap, it could require an 8% revenue increase per year for 10 years. Of course, Ontarians already pay the highest property taxes in the country. We would have to ask ourselves some pretty realistic questions about whether those increases are achievable or whether they're desirable. It would mean that a person paying $3,000 a year in property taxes in 2015 would be paying close to $6,700 by 2025. Another natural option is to look to the province for further uploads. In terms of what that option looks like, it is true that the provincial government balanced its books this year. However, we have to acknowledge that the total provincial debt exceeds $341 billion. 
The Provincial Financial Accountability Officer, who is independent of government and reports directly to the legislature, has indicated that there will be a steady deterioration in the budget deficit going forward. So against this backdrop, municipal governments have to ask, what is the likelihood of getting more financial assistance from the province? So this is a little bit of the history about how we've arrived at this bigger and bolder option. Let me just walk you through how it would work. The, basic, <clears throat> the basics of the local share are this. It would mean an increase to the provincial portion of the sales tax by 1% province-wide. We pay 13% now. We would increase the rate to 14%. And in the recent past, Ontarians have paid 15%. After providing rebates for low-income Ontarians and administration costs, we believe this will produce about $2.5 billion per year. These dollars would be collected provincially and redistributed to all municipalities based on an allocation formula. I'll talk about that allocation formula in a moment. What are the merits of this? There are four. Number one, it diversifies municipal revenues. It would close the infrastructure gap and provide for local needs. Number two, it would mean less vulnerability to provincial or federal policy change. Number three, it means more predictable long-term infrastructure planning and financing at the local level. And finally, number four, it is a more progressive option. It reduces the upward pressure on the property tax rates of course, as you well know, how much property tax an individual pays has no bearing on how much income they earn. In terms of our allocation approach, our starting point, as I said, is the distribution of $2.5 billion to 444 municipal governments across the province. We used a sliding scale per household uh, methodology to do that. It treats every municipality the same as we move through the scale. This is, we are, I recognize that we're not in a two-tier situation, but for uh, neighboring communities, in a two-tier situation, the per-household allocation obviously would be divided between both. The share of upper-tier uh, own source revenues would be used as a proxy for service responsibilities. So, for example, if County X had 45% of the revenues of all municipalities in that county, it would receive 45% share of those new revenues. This is what the sliding scale looks like. All of the allocations for every municipality in Ontario are posted on AMO's website. And I'll give you a link to, the, to uh, that, those allocations at the end of my presentation. We use the same model for all communities. <clears throat> this is one of the key elements of the proposal that we are putting forward. In terms of what this means to the city of Kingston, the illustrative allocation for Kingston is $24.73 million per year. So, what am, I, what am I here asking of you? First off, we're asking people to try on the idea, to see how it fits, to focus on the concept of what it means to diversify municipal revenues. Number two, how does the local share align with your local needs? That's a conversation that you need to have locally with your, uh, your staff. Third, if you're not sure about this concept, uh, please ask. Uh, I'm here to, today to answer as many questions as possible on the proposal, or you could read through some of the three reports that we have produced uh, on this proposal. And finally, let us know what you think. We welcome the support uh, of, uh, of councils and the public across Ontario. So if I were to conclude, as I said, all of the reports and all of the information are available at this, at this link. It includes videos of recent conference, uh, conference presentations, which also includes some polling results by Nick Nanos. AMO commissioned Nick Nanos, who does a lot of polling for the Globe and Mail and others, at three different times over the course of the last year and a half to get a reading on how Ontarians feel about these issues. At each poll, Nick asked 1,000 Ontarians from all corners of the province what they thought of this proposal. 
In all three polls, a majority of Ontarians were in favour of this option if it went to municipalities and if it went to fix infrastructure. As a matter of fact, the last poll we conducted in June of this year, the percentage of Ontarians who supported the local share increased to 73%. 73% of Ontarians are in favour of this bigger and bolder options. Bigger option. Ontario's municipal governments are perceived as being the most responsive order of government. Ontarians have an intimate understanding of what those local needs are, in large part because they live them every day. This is a strong voice of encouragement from the public. They have told us that they are willing to consider a bigger and bolder option. And I invite you and this council to consider what the local share could mean for your community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Councillor Osterhoff. Thanks uh, for your presentation. Uh, I was at the conference in Ottawa and um, I heard the presentation as well, the AMO conference, and it was very good and uh, enjoyed that a lot. And um, I, I, I did see the, uh, the rationale behind the 1% municipal sales tax, but I was quite blown away by uh, the three political party leaders that spoke that afternoon. And uh, they were, um, I was quite disappointed that all three were of the same. I mean, I mean, maybe it was a political move, I don't know. I can't always interpret that, but I was shocked that they didn't give it the recognition that I would have thought. So I wanted to know how, how have you responded since then? And is this part of the response that you're here, that you're still going out with the message, hoping before an election to, to get it out there? Because that's an important number, 73%. That was before the conference, but uh, how come that message didn't sink in deeper then to our leaders? I, I think um, I think the provincial party leaders are you know struggling with with how uh, how this would would be viewed more broadly by the public going into to a provincial election. I think that's a fairly natural uh, natural position for them to take. I suppose there were two things that I, I would answer that question in two ways. Um, Hazel McCallion, a, a, a few years prior, before her retirement as the mayor of uh, Mississauga, gave some parting advice to elected officials. And her advice was, never give up. Never give up in your struggle with the provincial or federal governments to make the case for municipal governments. Um, and I suppose that's, that's how I would respond to that as well. And, and I would also add to that that uh, AMO President Lynn Dolan ha said in, in that speech that this isn't going to be a sprint. This is, this is a marathon. This is about the next phase of, of where we want to take uh, uh, municipal governments and how we want to be able to provide for local needs uh, using a, a, a good, uh, a, a, you know, using resources and collecting them in, in, a, in a good way. So um, we recognize that, uh, that you know, the, those party leaders are obviously um, considering their, their platforms and, their, and their, their way forward. But as municipal leaders, I think we need to continue to make the case for sustainability, and, and that's what this is about. Okay, next on my list is Councilor McLaren. Thank you, I have a few questions for you. You mentioned that uh, it's 24.73 million per year that will be coming into Kingston, is that right? Yes. Um, how much will be leaving Kingston? So I understand that this has to be collected from the province and then gets redistributed, so there will be some winners and some losers. And what I'm concerned about is, is the money that's going to be taxed out of Kingston, that, and uh, the portion that's going to be taxed out of Kingston, is that going to be greater or less than the amount that's going to be repatriated back into Kingston? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of the model that we have uh, that we've designed, all of the, the dollars provincially would be collected and pooled and then redistributed. Um, there are some regions of the, the province with more active economies that produce a higher percentage of, of the provincial GDP than, than, than others. Um, and if we looked at purely, purely on municipal boundary lines, uh, it wouldn't provide sufficient levels of support for uh, vast portions of the province. So the, the model that we have uh, designed, uh, we haven't uh, measured the, the Kingston or any of the other communities across Ontario specifically, uh, but you would uh, be a net beneficiary, as, as all communities would be. Uh, so did I hear you say that uh, the, the, the regions that have the higher GDP are going to 
essentially support the ones with the lower GDPs and the greater needs? If you, uh, if we have to consider the economy as a as a whole in terms of its its broader provincial uh, broader provincial framework, and so there are areas of uh, the the province that uh, you know produce more economic activity than others, and so our our mandate was to come up with a solution for all communities across uh, across the province, um, and uh, you know if we if we just you know, the Greater Toronto Area, for example, is a, is a, produces a great amount of the provinces and the country's uh, economic uh, economic wealth. And if we did it just on municipal boundary lines, uh, it, it would not produce the, the type of uh, results that that would be beneficial for all communities. Okay. And the second question, if I may, is. Um, HST fluctuates according to consumer sentiment, so it's not like property taxes, which are pretty standard, but uh, as con consumer sentiment changes, uh, the amount that we would be getting or collecting at any one year would change. Wouldn't that make it harder to be to plan ahead? Um, that's a very good point. So the uh, sales tax does fluctuate with the economy, and if the, the economy uh, went down considerably, then some of that, that does pose a, a different type of revenue risk for, for municipalities. However, historically speaking, in terms of, and we've included this uh, statistic in one of our reports, uh, over time, uh, the, the provincial take of sales tax has, has dipped at a couple, of, a couple of points over the last 10 years, but generally speaking, it has been trending upwards uh, totally independently of inflation. So I think last, uh, I think in 2015, there were about $24 billion was were, were, uh, collected using, uh, using the sales tax. And uh, another question, if I may. Um, considering that this is going to be taking all the, um, the authority away from the, the, the municipality, how do we prevent um, the provincial government, say, from um, a cash-strapped provincial government from dipping into this fund for their own political purposes? Do we have any plans to safeguard our share? Um, in all honesty, the, the provincial government has the authority to, to make laws and, and change programs at any point in time. Uh, they could do that today, they could do it tomorrow. Um, I think one of the uh, beneficial elements of the provincial municipal financial relationship, certainly over the last 10 years, has been the upload agreement, uh, uploading of a variety of social services. And that upload agreement has... Um, it was an agreement between AMO and the provincial government and the city of Toronto, and the provincial government has upheld its its end of the bargain over the course of, of the last ten years. So, um, the only the, the principal benefit I think, or the principal argument that municipalities would say, is that if there are changes uh, that negatively affect municipalities to those cost share programs or infrastructure programs, um, in the long term they're going to uh, magnify the size of the municipal infrastructure deficit. And one of the key things that we found through the polling that we did is that Ontarians really do understand that there is an infrastructure deficit and they really do want to see something done about it. So I think there would be, would be uh, politically speaking, uh, I think Ontarians would be disappointed if uh, municipalities were, uh, if we were going to make those problems bigger rather than, than solve them. And my last question, if I may, um, you mentioned that this seemed to be a progressive um, move. I'm just, um, my understanding of progressive is that uh, a sales tax is not progressive because it unfavorably um, gets put onto the backs of people with low incomes who spend most of their income on taxable goods within the province. Um, how do you respond to that? So in terms of, um, if we look to compare it to the property tax, for example, I mean, you have um, the, the value of how much a person pays in the property tax uh, is has obviously the, 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 the key factor on that is the tax rate and the assessed value of someone's home. So uh, a, a widower who may have lived in a, a home for a long, long period of time that has increased in value considerably might be on a fixed income uh, and might not be able to afford those property tax increases. Um, so there, there is no relationship between the, the, that individual's income and how much property tax they pay where there is a relationship between uh, the, the amount that they consume uh, versus, uh, you know, in terms of how much uh, their income is. And I should also point out that 
Um, we have provided in this proposal uh, safeguards for low-income Ontarians. So we've provided $166 million of rebates for low-income Ontarians um, to, to get to that affordability issue a little bit better. And it, it extends the existing sales tax rebates for low-income Ontarians that exist for 13%. We've extended that out to, to the 14%, the proposed 14%. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, okay, so I guess first of all, thinking about, so if we're, if municipalities assume that this is how we're going to fix this imbalance, so you're referring a lot to infrastructure, but there are other services are included in here as well, um, which are more relevant to us in the city of Kingston since we do have our, our capital levy at the moment. So what is our ability to influ influence the provincial government uh, in terms of ensuring that there isn't further downloading, for example, if we are collecting revenue that the province might see as being something that they might like to have to pay for all the services that they need to provide as well. So how do we, can, how do we ward off any potential further downloading with this initiative in place? Well, if I, if I, uh, I think I'll answer that question by looking back historically. So, uh, of course, when uh, there were a number of programs that were downloaded to municipalities uh, during the a, a previous uh, Conservative government, um, and it took about 10 years of uh, municipalities across the, uh, across the province uh, pounding their fists and saying, this isn't working, this isn't working. It's, it's not, um, we can't build communities with these responsibilities and these revenue sources. So um, the upload agreement, which has been in place for 10 years, took took a few years of uh, strong advocacy on the part of councils and uh, locally elected officials across the province. Um, and a number of academics also weighed in on, on some of the inequities that that system presented for municipalities. So I think uh, to uh, the, the strongest case that municipalities can make uh, is to support one another and to, be, uh, to speak with one voice on these issues. Um, you know, providing good quality local services, uh, that's, that's what you're in the business of doing. Um, and I think they're, you know, you're joined by thousands of uh, other locally elected officials who are trying to do the same thing within the rules that are set by the province. Uh, okay, thank you. So um, the, the rebate that you referred to, uh, the the way of mitigating, let's say, the, um, the impact on low-income Ontarians. Would, there are currently re rebate programs in place, uh, for example, with the HST, that are not permanent. Would the idea be that a low-income rebate for, for this share of the tax be, I mean, it's a provincial decision, but would, would the idea be that it be permanent because, I mean, essentially, it doesn't have to be. What, what do you mean by uh, permanent? It so, so there are so there are provincial decisions. The current HST rebate um, put in place recently by the Liberal government in Ontario is not is not. There's nothing that guarantees it uh, in the long term. It's a program. It's not a permanent policy. Well, certainly um, <clears throat> we would be going into it with with the. Uh, assumption that all of the existing supports that are provided to low-income Ontarians would continue to be provided to them. Um, and I think that would be, be part of the, the a framework agreement in terms of you know, uh, providing that long-term assurance to, to low-income Ontarians that they're, they're not going to be negatively affected by a future policy change. So I think that would be part of the, the administration of, the, of, the, uh, of that framework. Councillor Kanan. Thank you. Um, I had a meeting with somebody a year ago and we were talking about uh, their business and they said every time they ended up getting behind with money, they just raised all their prices at their business. Um, and it seemed to work every time and nobody really noticed. Is this different than that? And if so, how? Well, certainly <clears throat> I would ask you to acknowledge that, you know, we've, we've talked about a, the gap that's $4.9 billion. And we've come up with a solution that solves half of that problem. So in terms of where we would get that other $2.4 billion, I think that will 
you know, com comes down to improved efficiencies uh, uh, at a local level, maybe property taxes that exceed the rate of inflation in, in some communities, depending on local circumstances. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to provide for the needs uh, of Ontarians locally. And, um, you know, if we want to continue providing the, the, the basket of services that we're, that we're currently providing, and we want to fix some of that hard infrastructure that, that is also part of that service, this is one of the steps that we need to consider if we want to be able to provide that for the long term. Um, and if we don't want to provide those that for the long term, then I think um, you know, we have to look at other, other options in terms of service withdrawals or, or other ways to try and finance uh, you know, a very stretched property tax dollar. Uh, second question is, uh, do we know, have we pinpointed what caused us to get into a position of shortfall? Um, so we don't uh, fall into something like this again. That seems like a staggering number to see, mm -hmm. just to see on a screen. Uh, how do we make sure something like this doesn't uh, happen again? Well, certainly it's something that has built, been built over, uh, over many years. So, you know, if we, if we look back in the last 20 years of the provincial municipal relationship, we sort of saw some of those seeds happen when, uh, when the, the downloading uh, took place during, during the Harris the Harris era, and the way that municipalities accommodated those new responsibilities at that time was to pull back on their capital spending. With the upload agreement that has taken place over the course of the last 10 years, that was, that was on the, the province's side, they, they agreed to take, take back financial responsibility for those services, and on the municipal side, municipalities agreed to reinvest more in infrastructure, and that has been happening. The, 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 the chart has been going upwards. In other words, both municipalities and the provincial government have met their commitments. So we have been making inroads, but we need to accelerate that even more if we want our infrastructure to be in a, a state of good repair for future generations. Councillor Hutchison. Uh, yes. Um, so I think one of the arguments you're making, um, I don't think you've made it quite this way, but is that what we're asking the province to do is to shift from um, a consumption tax that's diffuse in general to an infrastructure, to a, um, a direct measurable investment tax. And would you, that is centered on infrastructure. Would you agree? If, if we thought that there were not uh, significant negative impacts, and if we thought that all communities across the province could afford property tax increases like the one I showed you on the screen, then I, I wouldn't be here having this conversation with you. Um, but what we've tried to, to do is, is come up with a, 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 the best way forward in terms of uh, making uh, as, as little impact as possible on uh, asking all Ontarians to, 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 to pay a bit more, but to get some uh, good quality local services and uh, rebuild their infrastructure in return. So we, we are trying to diversify. This whole process is, is premised on the idea of diversifying revenues uh, because you know, we've certainly found that you know, we already pay the highest property taxes in the country. And that is, uh, we also deliver the most services of any uh, local government in, in Canada as well. Um, and we just think that there's probably, you know, we wanted to look and look under as many rocks as possible and see if there are better alternatives to property tax increases. And, and this is the proposal that we've, we've put forward. So when, secondary. Um, so when um, you're talking to the province, which I presume you do all the time, mm -hmm. um, do you, um, often the way these things are, or the province wants to sell them, or any province, not just the province, the feds, you know, that it's tax neutral somehow. So we get money from the province. Uh, I don't know that it's that much money, but we get money. So is part of your proposal to say, I'm just suggesting this might be a good idea, uh, don't give us that, we'll take the, the sales tax, municipal sales tax, and uh, you know, use it wisely, 
and especially for infrastructure. There can be some structure to that. So is that part of, and, and then that way the, the province can argue that, that it's an investment, but we're not really increasing your taxes that much. At least there's numbers to be crunched there, right? Have you looked at that? So have we looked at the other cost share programs and their relationship uh, with... Uh, with what you're proposing, yeah. So... I mean, um, I'm, I don't know, but I, there's probably arguments on both sides of this. So our assumptions, uh, we assume that the province and the federal government are going to continue to deliver what they have been delivering in the past. So uh, that is a, you know, a, a, base, a base assumption. Uh, in other words, if there was a change to that, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're just gonna make the infrastructure gap and we're gonna, we're gonna lengthen the time, the period of time needed to close it if, if there's any change to, those, to, the, to that financial relationship. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's hard to, to look forward uh, and, and forecast what, uh, what future governments are, you know, how, how those relationships are gonna, are, are what they're gonna look like. So we, we base it on election platform commitments and we base it on, as I said, a continuation of all existing, existing programs. And, and that's, I mean, you, you, you know, as I said earlier, you're, you're always at that, the risk and the mercy of uh, provincial policy change. And we think that there's a little bit less vulnerability um, under this proposal than, uh, than, than some of the alternatives. Thanks. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, uh, there, there's obviously no doubt that the gap exists. Uh, I guess my one question would be, has there been consideration uh, given to how much the, I guess, redistribution slash collection of this ta uh, tax would actually cost and how much of every dollar that we collect is actually going to get back to kind of the communities? Because obviously, sometimes things bureaucracies grow and then for every dollar you mm -hmm. collect only 75% is actually redistributed. So has there been consideration as to is this the most efficient means to get the biggest bang for, for the dollar collected? That, that's a very good question. So uh, in terms of the administration costs, I think we factored in a 1% uh, for, for administration costs, which is substantially uh, less expensive than any of the other, than the use of any other revenue tools. I mean, if you looked at, um, you know, if, if this, let's say uh, you were granted the authority to collect a land transfer tax, for example, in, in the city tomorrow, and you and you decided to set that, that up, administratively that will be much more burdensome and expensive uh, than, than this option. So we have made allowance for it, and uh, administrative efficiency was one of the key considerations. So just as a quick follow-up then, it seems like it would, piggyback on kind of existing infrastructure and systems that are already there and it's just simply kind of a check being cut based on a formula. Yeah, and that, that's one of the reasons why it makes it the most administratively okay. efficient. Perfect. We're just, just piggybacking exactly as you said. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, so with that we will move on. Uh, next up are petitions. Are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, uh, we do have one motion of condolence, moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council be extended to the family of Gord Downey, who passed away on Tuesday, October 17th, 2017. Our thoughts are with the Downey family, the remaining band members, and his friends during this difficult time. Here in the hometown of the tragically hip, Gord Downey was not only a talented artist, musician, and passionate advocate, he was family. Gore Downey has had a profound impact on our community, and it's been incredible to see the many different ways Kingstonians have been celebrating his life. So with that, we will call the vote, please. And that carries. On to deferred motions. We do have one deferred motion. It is moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Neal. I'm going to move through the whereas clauses and move to the action clauses. Therefore, be it resolved that the City of Kingston endorse the distribution of naloxone kits to all public institutions and an education and training program on how to use them as part of a community drug policy, and that all city-funded organizations be formally asked to participate and have available naloxone kits and the training to use them, including clear precautions stating recipients of naloxone may become instantly hyper-alert and or violent. 
and that the city of Kingston encourage the provincial government through the responsible ministers to work together to make meloxone kits easily available in all public institutions, and that the province enact legislation and regulations as needed to limit the liability on non-paramedic responders when administering the drug to treat an overdose, and that this resolution be forwarded to all municipalities in Ontario with a population greater than 40,000, with the request that they consider indicating their support for this most important initiative and that this resolution be forwarded to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario with the request that they include proposing a community drug policy that includes access to naloxone in their respective engagements with the provincial government, and that this resolution be shared with the Premier of Ontario, all opposition leaders, the Ministers of Health and Long-Term Care, opposition health critics, our local MPPs, the four school boards, and all city-funded organizations and that the Government of Ontario consider measures to immediately and directly over address the overprescription of legal narcotics by licensed physicians. Councillor McLaren, it is your motion. You have the floor. Okay, so we're bringing this back, and um, I think we've had the opportunity to uh, check some of the facts, look at uh, some of the questions. Um, I understand that Dr. Moore is here in case anybody still has any other questions. I've spoken with the Mayor. If anybody wants to ask a specific question to him, I understand that you would be okay with that. So I'm hoping that... Um, we all support this. We see that this is an important thing for saving lives, that everybody's lives matter, and that we can actually do some good here. This is all part of a major long-term and huge strategy, but it's what we can do right now, what can be done immediately here and now, and I hope that you guys will all consider it. And if you do have any questions, I hope that you will consider asking Dr. Moore behind me now. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal, will you take the chair, please? I will, and I recognize you. Thank you very much. Um, a couple things that I would like to say first. First of all, I'm 100% in support of the distribution of naloxone kits in our community. I don't think there's any doubt that this is something that is absolutely needed to address the opioid crisis uh, that is sweeping across the country. I would say, and I'm always careful not to speak for council, but I believe that council feels the same way. The reason why this motion was deferred was because there were some details that were missing. And because those of us around the table are not public health experts, we wanted some time to be able to consult with our public health experts, to be able to fill in those key details, like what's the plan? Where should we start? What locations should we start with that we can move forward from there? What sort of training policy should be around it so we know that these things are available but also that they're used properly? So after we deferred this motion, I had a chance to speak with Dr. Moore, who's very kind to be here this evening and has said that he's available to answer questions. But I asked for his help to help to craft an amendment that would help to fill in those details that we felt were missing at our last meeting. And so with his assistance, uh, we have crafted an amendment. Uh, Councillor McLaren has been kind to second it. So if I can just ask for that on the screen, please. So I'll give you a chance to, to look at it. But the, the, key, the key change is really to the first clause that would now spell out that we will place two naloxone kits with each automated external defibrillator in all city-owned and operated facilities with appropriate signage so that all staff and members of the public trained to use naloxone kits are aware of their location and can respond safely to an overdose using naloxone. And then that we would have an education and training program on how to use naloxone in accordance with the community drug strategy coordinated by KFLNA Public Health. And there's some other wording that is cleaned up so that we understand uh, not only what we're talking about, but if we're gonna be sending this to other municipalities in the province, that they understand what this means as well. So with that, I'm happy to put that on the floor. Uh, just a, a couple of other things that are, that are important. And I, I don't wanna put words in, in uh, Dr. Moore's mouth, but the conversations that we had is that this is a starting point. This will allow for continued conversations in the community about where else we can put naloxone kits. And it establishes Kingston as a leader, that we will be an example and we will show other municipalities the best way to be able to target this issue. 
I do need to make one point. There is no concern about stigma around this table. We agree that this is an important public health issue, and I believe that this amendment, amending the motion that's before us, will establish the leadership that Kingston can show what other communities can do to address this crisis. So with that, I certainly ask for your support of this amendment so that we can then support the motion on the floor. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, you have, you have the chair. Thank you. Then I, I would like to speak to the amendment, so I will pass the chair uh, uh, to Councillor Holland, if I might. I take the chair and I recognize you. Thank you. We're playing tag team here. Uh, I, I totally support uh, the, the amendment before us. I just want to point out, uh, just because there's a little bit of confusion sometimes in the community, there are certain organizations within our community that the city funds. I'm on the library board, have been for years. But the library board is governed by the Library Act, and although they get the, their funding from us, uh, in large part, they need to make the decision independently. Um, but the wording of the motion, I think, at least gives those organizations a nudge and asks the question. So hopefully, uh, those other organizations, uh, whether it's Kingston Access Services or, or the library, uh, can go ahead and... Uh, support this worthy cause as well. Thank you. Thank you, I return the chair. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I like the amendment. It's along the same lines of the things that I thought were missing, specifically location of uh, where to start with the kits. There's never, like, the, like your worship said, there's never any doubt in my mind that, that this was a necessary step, uh, making kits available. I'm a registered nurse, I've administered uh, Narcan before, uh, and uh, there's already, I, as I proposed a couple amendments last time that passed, that, that filled in a couple of the gaps. There was more gaps, thus the deferral. Couldn't agree more. I, I don't think there's any further gaps that I can think of with the knowledge that, that your worship has, has said that this is a starting point. In other words, once we've started with the, where the AEDs are, which, which the great thing about that is that everybody knows where the AEDs are because they've been out in the community for a while. And uh, it is very much parallel to that initiative that was uh, several years ago now. The, uh, the, the idea that you could save a life with defibrillation uh, with, as long as the kit was, was close enough because with cardiac arrest you have only a few minutes, two or three minutes really. Uh, before you have to act. So the same thing with Narcan, it's, it's a very similar situation, but you would run into trouble if you didn't know where the kits were located, and even if you gave out thousands of kits, uh, there would be confusion at the time if it wasn't really clear where they, so that, anyway, basically to say that this is a very obvious place to start, but I don't think it's the end, so I think we need to uh, have public health and other experts help us identify more locations but for, uh, for tonight, I'm very happy to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McLaren, speaking to the amendment. Thank you. And uh, just a quick question as to, could I have some clarification as to why the all public institutions was replaced with communities? I'm hoping communities is considered a larger category, but just some clarification would be great. And I recognize the mover. Thank you. Yes, so if council recalls from our previous conversation, that was one of the concerns we had. Nobody knew what all public institutions meant. Did that just mean city facilities? Was that meant to be something broader? So that sort of misinterpretation would be key if we're sending this motion to every other municipality over 40,000 people in Ontario. So by using communities, then it's meant to be broader so absolutely, this is not restrictive. It's meant to encourage and endorse, obviously, that distribution. But it's a word that everyone understands. So that was the reason why we went with that word. And the second question, if I may? Yes. 
And um, I understand that uh, when we put in the um, defibrillator thing, we also launched an app that allowed people to respond to that if they were trained with that. I was wondering if it's technically feasible also to have an additional kind of app that somebody who's trained in using naloxone would be able to uh, respond in the event of an emergency. Yes, I recognize the commissioner. Thank you, and uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. So we, uh, it, this is something we can look into. I, I don't have the answer um, to, to your question, uh, Councilor McLaren, right now, but we could definitely look into that. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Um, I would like to thank the Mayor and Councilor McLaren for this motion. Um, I agree, this does make it much clearer and uh, I do believe, I agree, it makes Kingston a leader. Um, I haven't seen anything like this anywhere before now. Um, certainly know about the problem, certainly know about it personally, uh, certainly know about it in the community, and uh, I think that this is a very, very good, helpful motion, and I'm proud to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Or opposed? <laughs> Thank you, and I return the chair. Thank you. So now on the motion as amended, is there any further discussion? Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you very much. I. Uh, we'll try to go through this fairly quickly because it's going to be a late night. I really appreciate the amendments, and I just want to say uh, I am on Kingston Frontenac, Lennox and Addington, KFLNA Public Health, uh, and we're blessed with having one of our provinces or one, a Canadian expert on opioid abuse uh, as our medical officer of health. Uh, Dr. Moore. So, and it was the initiative at KFLNA that uh, my colleagues uh, that are now on KFLNA, Councillor Holland and Councillor McLaren, and previously uh, Councillor Stroud, uh, were, were brought up to speed and just how important this is. I have a few. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to Alpha, which is the public health uh, provincial organization, uh, to a meeting, and the chief medical officer of health, uh, Dr. David Williams, gave a wonderful PowerPoint presentation, which is now available because it's arrived as uh, as as uh, an official document, so anybody can find it. Uh, it's, it really shows just how, oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, the increase, pardon, okay, the increase of, sorry, I'm learning how to use this high tech thing. Uh, this, this is a chart that shows the incidence in across the country with the peaks and valleys. And, and Kingston, indeed, has a fairly high number uh, per 100,000 population. We're higher than Toronto, which would surprise a lot of people, uh, for deaths uh, caused by opioid abuse. Uh, this shows opioid-related deaths in Ontario, and you can see how much they've substantially increased in the last decade. And unfortunately, the 2017 numbers aren't out yet, but that upward trend will indeed be continuing. Uh, and the main cause is clearly fentanyl. Uh, that's the red line that you see uh, substantially spiking upwards in the last three years. Uh, and 
this is the number, cases of opioid-related emergency visits and hospitalizations in Ontario. Ontario. So there's an enormous cost that goes far beyond what the cost of making uh, a, a kit available to counteract that. This is an naloxone kit, which is, I understand, provincially funded. Uh, this is the nasal kit, and it's available uh, for free at Street Health, at a number of, uh, of uh, drug dispensaries and at public health. So there's no reason why uh, anybody who has family or friends who are opioid users shouldn't try to acquire one of these kits. Uh, the, the reality is that the number of deaths, and I, I agree to a certain extent that if this were a SARS epidemic or some other epidemic that was causing the deaths at this rate, 30 seconds, we would be all over it. And thankfully, the province has indeed followed the advice of our provincial chief medical officer, Dr. David Williams, and is making these available. We need to make sure that they're readily available across the city, and I hope somebody challenges the school board to do the same. Thank you. Is Thank you. Any, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Bohm? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, there's, there's no doubt that this is an epidemic and uh, it's definitely something that we want to get in front of as much as possible. So, you know, this is one part of it. The other part is, is you know, coming up with treatment methods and everything like that. However, I was actually uh, able to sit in uh, with a uh, briefing on kind of where this is going with Kingston Police and the reality of it is, is, is terrifying. Um, the amounts of some of the previous street drugs that were out there that are lethal are, you know, enough where you'd hold it in your hand and kind of it's, it's a substantial amount. With fentanyl and carfentanil, you're talking grains. Like it's like three to four grains of sand that can actually lead to death in an overdose. So, I mean, the, cre the, the, the most sobering thing in that entire... Uh, sort of a presentation was the fact that there's actually other drugs which are coming out after this that are possibly a hundred times more effective and these are being made by chemists and you know they're they're originally usually made for a benign pur uh, purpose like pain treatment or something like that and then they're harvested and turned into a type of street drug so this is literally trying to get in front of something that you know it, it's just going to get worse if we don't do this. And so this is something which, I, as, as the mayor mentioned earlier, this is a starting point. This is something where we can be a leader. And the problem's not going to disappear if we ignore it. And if, if you get a chance to go to any of those briefings on this stuff, it's, it's truly terrifying um, what's actually out there. And it could be something as simple as just a pill that was mixed poorly and in, in, a, in a magic bullet blender and, and it seems like it's, you know, it's something that they're cutting uh, cocaine with to try to, to try to take an impure cocaine and give it a little bit more kick and all of a sudden it's a bad blend and then that person, you know, it, it dies from that. And, and this is a kit that can, you know, hopefully prevent that. And uh, as Councillor Neal, or Deputy Mayor Neal mentioned, any pharmacy pretty much, I think you can go to and request one and they're free. So, so this is something that I wholeheartedly support and I think the amendment was great. It definitely clarifies this and it becomes something that we can definitely send on to other municipalities and, and hope for further support on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Candon. Thank you and through you. I guess I uh, obviously I'm gonna support uh, this and always intended to and I'm not trying to speak for all councillors but um, I think the approach that we took may have been misinterpreted. I think everybody here was obviously going to support this. Um, me and myself personally, uh, I don't know a lot about it and because of that I didn't want to necessarily come up with the wrong strategy without thinking things through because I am certainly not an expert in this even though I do acknowledge that it does need to be addressed and that it is very important. Um, you know, you hear uh, in 
in, uh, you know, if peacekeepers leave food for uh, war-ridden countries and the people don't actually end up getting that food, they they probably should have thought of a better plan to help people. Um, I think we were trying to come up with a strategy to make sure that there wasn't an incident where our strategy wasn't good enough or we kind of just quickly ran it through, um, assuming everything was okay, because I'm not an expert in this, and I think that uh, it's it was kind of nice that we took a bit of time to figure, to make sure that everything was appropriate and we do have the correct strategy. Um, if it was interpreted in such a way that we didn't uh, uh, feel it was important, then I do apologize. It may have been misconstrued. We just want to make sure that uh, we are doing things appropriately and that we're asking uh, professionals and getting expert advice so that we can do things uh, in, a meaning, in a meaningful way. Uh, so I just want to clear the air with that. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, we will call the vote on the motion as amended. Please vote. Uh, and that carries. Okay, moving on to reports. First we have report number 107 from the CAO, please. Moved by Councillor Cannon, seconded by Councillor George, that report number 107 from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Okay, so there are six uh, clauses. There is one we're separating for a pecuniary interest. Is that, do I have that right? No, that's for the other report. Okay, are there any uh, clauses to be separated? Councillor Hutchison? Number one. Any other separations? Okay, so we will first vote on the remaining clauses and then we'll circle back to number one. So clause number two is a word of contract for advanced nurse call system, Rideau Crest Home. Clause three, approval of initial study grant application for the property located at 9 North Street. Clause four is parking bylaw minor amendments. Clause five, sign retro re reflectivity annual inspection. And Clause 6, Kingston Access Services, Service Agreement. Call the vote, please. And that carries. Back to Clause number 1, North Kingstown Secondary Plan, Phase 2 Technical Studies Award of Contract. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, uh, just a question on um, regarding the, the transportation plan. This is led by Arup. I presume I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm just wondering uh, if we could get a, uh, an explanation, a description of who Arup is and what else have they done. Ms. Agnew? Thank you, and through your worship, um, Arup is a reputable transportation expert, so they were brought on, um, hand-selected by Dialogue, um, and, and they were involved in some of the, the earlier pieces to do with the divisioning piece. I can't um, give you a CV of other projects specifically off the top of my head, but I'm happy to provide that information to you separate from this discussion. That would be fine. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote then on clause one. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, on to report 108 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that report number 108 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, so the first clause is Seniors Association Kingston Region Amendment to Lease Agreement. Councillor Shell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I had a chat with the uh, Seniors Association um, a few weeks ago about this, 
and uh, I hadn't realized that they were paying an 8% uh, interest rate. Um, and I also uh, know how important uh, this association is, and, uh, and with their expansion to um, the uh, Rideau Heights area, uh, I think that this is an excellent agreement that uh, the city has uh, reached with them. Um, the Seniors Association is a very strong uh, member of the Kingston community, and this will help them expand their activities, and uh, I'm in full support of this. Thank you. Thank you. You will call the vote on Clause 1. And that carries. Clause 2, Neighborhood Park Improvement Project Request for Funds, Polson Estate. Councillor Shell. Another one in my district um, that's close to my heart. When I was first a, a very young councillor, um, some citizens from Fair Fairway Hills Park came, or Fairway Hills uh, North and South came to talk about their parkette and how overgrown it was. And uh, with the help of the council of the day and staff, we did approve um, this improvement project. And I would like to thank staff very much for uh, finding a way to uh, make this happen. It, it had become quite expensive over the years as the years had passed. And uh, we were the members of the group that uh, helped organize this and I are really quite thrilled at uh, the possibility of this moving forward a little faster than we thought. So uh, I hope that council can support this, what I think is a very worthwhile and lovely little park. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the vote on Clause 2. And that carries. Clause 3, deep water dock and cruise ship options. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a question for staff. Uh, I I had the opportunity to have a uh, offline conversation with the commissioner about this uh, interesting item. Um, basically, just for the benefit of the members of the public that uh, were, this is just coming on their radar, in the motion you see that uh, there's a dollar amount, 80,000 uh, immediate cost if we pass this tonight. And, but there's also talk about uh, cost of dredging uh, if we went forward with uh, seriously using one Queen Street as a uh, docking area for medium-sized boats. And I was going to ask, um, it, would that be just the jet dredging cost and the cost of the study? Is that all, sort of everything that's involved with this kind of thing? Commissioner Hurdle? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So the um, the dredging that is estimated in the report, and I want to make sure it's clear, obviously, that this is an estimate, um, would accommodate some of the larger cruise ships, but not all of them. So if we were interested in accommodating the, the largest ones um, that are coming through, which is the Hamburg, we would have to look at not just dredging, but probably an extension as well. So that's not factored in here, but this is what we're asking councils for some direction in terms of going back and pulling together all of that information so we can return with all of the cost and, uh, and also the, the business uh, plan portion of, uh, of this. Thank you. Uh, I have a second question. So I, was, I, went, I went down there yesterday and had a look. Um, so everyone knows it's been there for a while and the, the wharf itself at the, behind Tim Hortons, right? It's slightly overgrown with vegetation when you get near the end of the wharf. Uh, that obviously could easily be cleaned up. The question I had be, was because on the east side, uh, opposite the Wolf Island dock, there's a bunch of old, small uh, cement uh, docks that jut out from the main wharf where you could, uh, were used probably back in the day for personal watercraft. And um, that side of the wharf is not as long as the east side, which is the Holiday Inn side. It would, is the idea in this preliminary stage that both sides could potentially be uh, in play for larger ships? Commissioner Hurdle. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So we have looked uh, specifically at the side 
next to or on the site of the Holiday Inn. Um, and the reason for that is because of the what we anticipate the expansion to of the MTO uh, ferry to take place. And with the ships coming or the, the, uh, the boats coming in, uh, this is part of the reason why we would like to have further conversation with the property owner and also MTO to be able to look at all of these options. But right now we have looked at the side that's closest to, uh, to the Holiday Inn. Thank you. I plan to support this first preliminary step. I, I find the the dollar ask is quite modest for for answer for asking and answering the question that I think uh, now that it's been uh, raised by our strategic priorities in 2015, it should should really be answered. And I'd also like to point out that I spoke to Doc, um, Councillor Turner yesterday about this, and she couldn't be here tonight, and she wanted to make sure she that I uh, put in a word of hers. She can't vote tonight, but she's in favor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I imagine she is in favor. Um, okay, Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. Um, I, I did forward some questions um, uh, to staff uh, from somebody who is quite knowledgeable and has had some years in the industry. And one of the things I, that was questioned was the whole idea of a business study, uh, a feasibility study for uh, this. We uh, have had the potential for not very large ships, but some ships that are part of the uh, uh, of, of of that business and that haven't yet availed themselves of. Uh, possibility for docking here. So I'm just wondering, uh, will the 80,000 be sufficient to also do uh, a detailed feasibility business study uh, on this location? Commissioner Hurdle. Through you, Mr. Mayor. So that's the intent that part of these funds would be utilized to look at uh, the, the whole business case. But in order for us to do that, we, we need to have some kind of direction at which location we're going to be looking at because the cost associated with, uh, with the location would change depending on, on which location we would be considering. And uh, the commissioner reminded me today because it's been, I knew that this had been on the agenda back in the 90s. Uh, but as I understand it, there is an OMB uh, uh, permission for a hotel to go on that site. Is that accurate? Ms. Agnew? Thank you, and through you, that's correct. I'm not sure that would be a brilliant idea, given our waterfront master plan and our, our uh, OP and our positions today, but indeed, uh, the OMB ruling would still be in force or be enforceable. Is that accurate? That's correct. Enough said. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm um, similar to Councillor Neal's request for a business case. I had an email today that um, from a constituent who's concerned that um, that the city will see economic benefit for the cost that we're going to spend on the wharf because it will be like daytime cruise ships, so people will still be sleeping on the cruise. It'll just be you know what shopping they do at our restaurant, at our stores and the restaurants, and if that economic spinoff will actually outweigh what the city might be putting into it. So. Um, when we get the report back, the economic benefits could be part of that report as well. Commissioner Hurl. Through you, yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I thank the previous uh, councillors for their questions about the need for a business case um, on the grounds that I've also heard about reservations about public expenditures with, with private green coming from those public expenditures. So <clears throat> I think that's serious. My question uh, is slightly different though. We have the situation there where we're think, looking at a ferry expansion and we have our ongoing issues with the causeway. 
So I'm wondering if we're going to be looking at the traffic and the traffic flows there if this expansion of people coming off takes place. Because I'm assuming that we're doing this for and with in regard to the uh, ships that dock or come close to docking now, but with the idea that there might be more. Commissioner Hurdle. So through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I can only speak at this point to uh, the potential of having uh, cruise ships dock in Kingston. So the individuals that would come off of these cruise ships would be walking downtown. Um, they, they would not, this, this would not be a situation where people would be driving to, to the dock. They, the, the cruise ship would come dock at, uh, at 1 Queen Street, get off the cruise ship, and then be able to walk downtown. And that was part of the reason why we identified this site as a, an ideal location, because it is uh, located in the heart of downtown. Thank you. I was thinking about the interaction between car and pedestrian traffic, but the reply is fine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Schell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I was really pleased um, to read this report. Uh, again, tourism and the incredible potential for the city of Kingston. I mean, from what I know of cruise ships, when they park, they have a whole list of activities for people to do. And in advance, you get your tickets to the fort or the penitentiary or uh, play a round of golf, um, and they have a bus there. So the traffic issue isn't something that would normally be um, in, uh, an issue. Um, I'm sure the business plan will bring in all this, this sort of thing. And then, of course, just the ability of people to get off and walk around our beautiful city. Um, I think the potential is huge, again, for uh, just increasing um, the uh, world interest in such a, a gorgeous place to come and visit. So I'm very much in favor of this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, I may be a little biased, but I think Kingston has one of the most beautiful waterfronts uh, of any city that I've ever been to. Uh, and also, I think it's one of the things that uh, we should be leveraging. And this is something that ever since I've been on council, I was really hoping that something like this was going to come up. And I know location's always been something that was discussed, and there were a few other kind of considerations. But the fact that this is right downtown that was mentioned is kind of key, because that's basically where you want these people to unload where you want them to spend their time, where you want them to do tours and spend their dollars. So with something like this, it's it's super exciting to see this come forward. Um, on a from hearing from constituents and many people on this, I've actually uh, I was I was thrilled with the fact that I heard nothing but positive feedback on this. It seemed to be something that it was almost just why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you spend the money and invest it? And uh, some of the comments were like, this is the, the sort of the one piece of, of the puzzle that Kingston's missing as far as economic development and tourism. So if we can lock this down and if the studies are uh, favorable, I think it's a no-brainer that we should pursue this. So I'll definitely be uh, voting in support of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rostov. Yeah, I just want to echo the words of uh, Councillor Bohm and um, <clears throat> through you, Mayor, sorry. And um, I just think that uh, I've had positive feedback already from that and uh, even sitting sitting here, people are uh, very anticipating that this could be something very successful for the city and to grow our tourism and uh, our downtown, but not just downtown. Uh, it, like um, Councillor Shell said, this is uh, something for the greater benefit of uh, um, the entire city. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I do, and I'll recognize you, and I'll Thank stop you. looking at the scores. We've had lots of, uh, lots of positive comments on this around the table, so I'm just going to uh, chime in with my two cents on this. Uh, I think when this issue really hit the radar for me was a couple of summers ago when we started to see those large ships anchoring out in the water and then having um, uh, ferry boats basically bring people back and forth to our downtown, and I really got a sense at that point that there really is a potential. Um, I've actually had conversations with other mayors and other officials across the province about the growing cruise ship industry in the Great Lakes. 
which is not necessarily something we may have all have thought of before. Uh, clearly, there's a growth uh, potential there. I know that there is a lot of work that's happening at provincial level right now in terms of mar understanding what that market looks like, what the opportunities are. So I think it's exciting to look into, but I'm also really excited about taking what I think is one of the most underutilized, underdeveloped portions of our waterfront and making it spectacular. Uh, it's really uh, great timing that we know that the province yesterday announced that they're going to have the second ferry over to Wolf Island, and we know there's a great opportunity for them to be able to redo that terminal, which is right next to the Queen Street dock. Think about the potential for what that piece of waterfront could look like if we're able to, to make some progress on this. Uh, to Deputy Mayor's point about the waterfront master plan, I think that absolutely should be a key consideration. Right now, that piece of waterfront is not walkable at all. I would love to see a way that we could make it and transform it into to waterfront pathways out into the water. Uh, I think there's great potential there. So I too look forward to seeing where these discussions go and I'm uh, excited to see the results of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any, oh, uh, can I have the, can I Yes, have the I will return the chair. Thank you very much. So anybody else that wishes to speak? We will call the vote on clause three, please. And that carries. Clause four, Rogers K-Rock Center naming sponsorship agreement extension. Deputy Mayor Neal. My only question regarding this, um, uh, it's, do we just have the one organization, SMG, who are the uh, con contracted body? Are they the only ones that seem to be shopping this around? Uh, have we, uh, do we have an opportunity for uh, CATCO or our tourist bureau or other, other people to, to seek a, a sponsor? Because I appreciate that K, K Rock is extending it so that we aren't six months without any income, but it is important for us to be able to maintain to, to, it's important money for that uh, venue and it's taxpayers' money if we aren't able to find a sponsor. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. So absolutely, SMG, first of all, was uh, contracted to uh, actually um, work on the naming rights as per our agreement uh, renewal with SMG. So they are they are having conversations with uh, with different parties, and in this case, the the reason for extending is not so much an issue of revenue. Well, it is revenue, but it's also the timing. Uh, having a name change right in the middle of a hockey season, OHL hockey season, is not uh, the best approach. So, in terms of conversations that we've been able to have with SMG and also the the Frontenacs, it was felt that the extension at this point was the best uh, first step forward while the conversations around long-term naming rights are still going on. So, uh, I presume, that, therefore, we don't have a kind of angel in the wings that is willing to so, uh, sponsor so, it? So, Deputy Mayor, so that that's not the... That's not the crux of this recommendation that's before us. That will come. I hate it when I have to say you're right. Okay. <laughs> I withdraw that question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll call the vote on clause four, please. And that carries. Report number 109 from Planning Committee. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I rise to present Report number of 109 from the Planning Committee for Council's consideration. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that report number 109 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so first we have uh, Clause 1 that's been separated for uh, Councillor George. 
so that is approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 783 King Street West. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Uh, are there any other clauses to separate? Seeing none, we will vote on them as a whole. So clause two is approval of an application for zoning by law amendment 299 to 303 Concession Street. Clause three, approval of an application for official plan and zoning by law amendment 225 King Street East. Clause four, approval of an application for zoning by law amendment 306 to 308 Montreal Street. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Report number 110 from Heritage Kingston. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> I'm standing to present uh, Report 110, moved and seconded for Council's consideration. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Shell, that report number 110 from Heritage Kingston be received and adopted. So there are a number of items under both the statutory consultation and non-statutory consultation. Would anyone like any of the items separated? Councillor Shell? Number one, please. So is that number item one under number one? Uh, I'll comment on both. On both, okay. So, Okay, we'll just uh, deal with that right off the bat. So number one, approval of applications recommended for approval. Number one, notice of intention to designate under the Her Ontario Heritage Act. And we have a number of uh, properties listed. Councillor Shell. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, this council has been remarkable, in my opinion, of <laughs> at designating properties. And I believe staff has the number of how many this particular council has designated in the last three years. Oh, Ms. Hegner. Thank you, and through you, um, so for since 2014, we did six designations as a community. In 2015, we did nine Part 4 designations. In 2016, we did five Part 4 designations at 136 listings. And in 2017, to date, with the ones that are on the agenda tonight, that will make 29 Part 4 designations. Thank you. That, I just find that remarkable because this is my second term. And in the first term, we seem to be just doing them in little dribs and drabs. And now we have um, the two, uh, three uh, heritage districts two of which have been passed, uh, one updated in this council, and now this amazing number of designations and listings, which means we are protecting the heritage of this city, this particular council, in just a remarkable fashion. And I think we can give ourselves a pat on the back. We've got another nine uh, tonight, including KCVI, which I know there were people worried about that one because it's been so altered. So I think it's, it's tremendous. And there's another section, um, proposed new civic collection acquisitions. That's another thing that the Heritage Committee now does. We, we literally discuss the various items that people are donating to the City of Kingston and if they are appropriate for us to accept in our civic collection. When I started um, learning about uh, the civic collection back when we were discussing a culture plan, we had no idea what we owned. Um, it was amazing. There were statues and monuments and cannons all over the city and no one knew who owned them. And it's been a process um, of tightening all of our, our structures and, and having staff now in place that we can actually have a civic collection acquisitions uh, committee on the Heritage Committee and, and, and do this work. So um, I'm just really, really pleased that I think this, this is a council that has done a, an amazing job um, for the heritage of the city of Kingston, and I thank everybody, and I'm happy to support all this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Worship, and thank you, Councillor Shell, for um, for bringing up that uh, 
that reality, and uh, the, it's like we've, um, I like to think of it as a high score of designations uh, that a, of any council. And so very proud, uh, and you guys should be proud too, that this is uh, staff's work mostly, but also with the Heritage Properties Working Group, uh, sifting through all of the different properties. Uh, there's a lot of work involved. Um, but I'm just gonna say a couple words about the first one on here. Uh, some people might think this was a long time coming. Just to sort of sum, up, sum it up in a very simple way, we heard from the DBIA at the very beginning of this meeting, their fifth and sort of, they always seem to keep their, their sort of most impactful pewter ornament for the last week. That number five this time is KCVI in a re-release, right? So the KCVI building as a pewter ornament. So it's, it's, it's the first time something's been done twice, I believe. So it was, it was uh, noteworthy enough for uh, the DBIA to, to re-release it uh, as a pewter ornament, which in itself is a is is you know it's a commemoration of something to be remembered, right? Well, this is sort of a, the same thing. Uh, this sort of makes it official if from a bylaw point of view, right? Uh, that uh, the historical aspect of KCVI is something we'd like to cherish and hold on to, regardless of what the future use of the site is. Uh, that's that's how you do it. You do it with a designation, and just to remind members of the public that aren't sure about how. Uh, which parts of the building and what, you know, what needs to be, uh, you know, designated. The designation goes into that detail. We discussed it at the committee. It, it just lists the heritage attributes. There was a consultant involved. What is of value? And that's what, how the bylaw is written. And then it just has to be considered in any future use of the site that the, uh, the valuable uh, elements uh, get uh, considered in any any future decisions. So I'm very happy about this and about the rest of the designations and uh, uh, personal thanks to staff for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote on both items one and two under number one, please. Please vote. And that carries. Now we will call the vote on the items under the non-statutory consultation. Please vote. And that carries. Report number 111 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. I'd like to present uh, report number 111 from Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee. Thank you. And I believe we have a request to separate one. Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number 111 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee be received and adopted. So there are two clauses. Number one, bi-monthly scheduling of meetings. Councillor Hodgson? Please separate. It has been separated. Do, do you wish to speak to it? I just want to say that I oppose this at committee and I'm opposing it here. Uh, the reason is, uh, are two. One, the committees have traditionally been one of our most significant portals for community input, where issues could be brought forward by the public and by councillors, but often by the public, um, and have it discussed and sent on to council or brought back to the committee or just given a hearing sometimes, so that in a more informal situation than having to get the, the item on a council uh, agenda. And sometimes that's all it took. And then sometimes it would take some time, but it would come around again. And eventually some of them, those initiatives got council approval. And so I'm loath to close one of those portals. We're supposed to be pursuing public engagement and further and uh, 
making the city more open and transparent, and I don't see how this helps. I don't think it's also necessary because the committee meetings can be canceled by when there's no work. So I'm not sure, and that could be done well before the meeting, and it does happen, and I don't see how this uh, increases our democratic um, process. So that's why I'm going to oppose this, and I, I, I would like council to consider that. And if it's about saving money, which I got a feeling is what it's all about, then when the budget comes up, this will be yet another thing to, you know, the, the clerks are gonna put things forward so they can meet the budget that they're given, you know, or that they're told they have to meet. This is a yet another thing where, when we ask what are the cuts that are made to make the budget balance, and we don't really get an answer, there's no list, this will be another one, to go along with certain recreation programs and other things I could mention, like snow removal. So that's why I oppose this. Those are my reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, I too oppose this at, at ARC, and I'm going to vote against it today. Um, it, I, we, we increasingly, and uh, EITP came up in the conversation about this as well. We increasingly seem to have less work brought to us and often staff through CAO reports, they bring forward things that my sense is traditionally in 2011, 2012, 2013, uh, those would come either as information reports to those umbrella committees for sharing or with a recommendation that would give the public an opportunity to speak to it and then it would go to council. Uh, when, that, uh, when that isn't followed, then what happens is we get recommendations uh, in CAO consent or recommend reports and the public have no opportunity to speak to it. Our committee rules allow public, the public to speak to uh, anything that is on the agenda as an action item. So, uh, so Councillor Hutchison is right. It usurps that other opportunity for the public to speak. Uh, and so for that reason, I'll vote against it. I've chaired a number of umbrella committees. When there hasn't been a business required, when there hasn't been a delegation coming, I quite willingly have agreed to cancel a meeting. But I don't think, I, I don't think going to alternating weeks is the most democratic thing to do. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, if memory serves, I was actually the chair of the admin policy uh, when, committee when we did this and we moved to every other month, and uh, it seemed to work really well there. I'm not a big believer in just having a meeting for the sake of having a meeting. I want to have a meeting where there's a good, solid agenda with good things to be done. We all have busy, busy schedules. Um, the, the community has busy schedules. If we want to talk about consultation, we now have... Uh, in today's day and age, so many different ways that we're contacted. So, I mean, rather than showing up to a meeting that lasts all of 10 minutes when I could have gone out and actually had a coffee with a constituent, um, just to simply pass something that could have been pushed off to the next month, that doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense with everybody's busy schedule. And, and this, the pace of the world's only increasing. So any time that we can free up to connect with the community and other means is definitely worthwhile. Um, further to that, basically, uh, some of the committees that we have um, essentially don't always have 
you know, full plates all the time. But when they do have enough, we meet. With this too, it's always at the discretion of the chair to be able to call another meeting. So if there's something that comes up, you call the meeting. But if not, you can schedule that, you know, that consultation or, you know, you can have another night to prepare a report. Councils are always free to bring motions forward to council as well. So, I mean, if somebody has an idea that they want you to explore, it doesn't have to go through a committee. It can just be something that we can discuss or bring forward a motion on. So, I mean, I don't really see this as hampering things. I think we've asked staff and we've tasked them to find efficiencies where they can. And this is simply just a result of what we've asked them to do. So, I mean, when you've asked somebody to do something, they come with you to a solution, and then you turn down the solution, it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense to me. So, I'm gladly going to support this, and, and I think it's definitely the right direction. And I think it doesn't really do anything negative because the chair can always call, if, if maybe they end up calling every single meeting that was cancelled or, or, or postponed, and then we meet, great. If they don't, great. It's a win-win. Thanks very much. Okay, we will call the vote on clause one. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 10 to two. Clause two, Rural Homelessness Service System Strategy Review. Councilor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to review this several times now, uh, being on relevant committees, uh, and I just wanted to take a moment to um, bring a few of these items to the attention of council uh, and the public, and to thank staff for all of their hard work. Uh, we currently are in a situation where approximately a third of staff time is spent traveling, uh, so these are people who, are, who set out to... Um, to dedicate themselves to, to help serving homeless populations and people living in poverty in, in various parts of the region. And so this report attempts to find ways to, to draw on efficiencies with other organizations and to ensure that uh, service delivery is, is enhanced and most importantly that um, individuals who are living in poverty or, or homeless in the rural areas are able to be served in their home communities because it is quite important for that, uh, to have that level of comfort and uh, long-term stability initiated. So my thanks to staff for all of the work uh, in, in putting this together. Thank you, Councillor Hutchison. I just wanted to uh, say a similar thing to Councillor uh, Holland is that this, provides for more equitable service to the, the rural um, uh, population that's in need, uh, where staff have uh, done a really good job, actually, I think, um, in identifying the, the, lack, the lacks, the failings of the current situation, and this is a move to approve it. And this will result hopefully a more equitable and fair service to rural inhabitants. And uh, it'll take a couple of additional staff because they realize that the area that's being treated is way bigger <laughs> than the urban city and, uh, and much, more, much less densely populated. So, but the po folks that need the service are still out there. And it's also hoped that when they um, come to the city for whatever reasons, you know, for a job or services or to get homeless uh, services, that we as a city will be able to get them back into their own communities, their rural hamlets and so on, uh, where they know people and they have family and so on, and they'll be able to be serviced better. So I think all in all, this, is, this strategy review is quite good and staff is to commend it for working it out. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the vote on clause two. And that carries. Report number 112 from the Rural Advisory Committee. I am uh, pleased to uh, present to Report 112 from the Rural Advisory Committee. Yeah. 
Moved by Councillor Osterhoff, second by Councillor Baum, that report number 112 from the Rural Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So it's just the one clause, 2016 Rural Advisory Committee report card. Please vote. We'll call the vote. And that carries. Report number 113 from the Nominations Advisory Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. It gives me pleasure to uh, present report number 113 from the Nominations Advisory Committee, duly moved and seconded. Moved by Councillor Boehm, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that report number 113 from the Nominations Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause, Appointments to Economic Development Organization 2017 Performance Review Working Group. Councillor Boehm. I actually have a uh, motion to amend Report 113, Clause 1. Okay. It's uh, that Report 113, Clause 1, be amended by deleting Paragraph 1 in its entirety and adding a new final paragraph which reads as follows, that the Economic Development Organization 2017 Performance Review Working Group be composed of Scott Carson, Queen's University School of Business, and Simon Froggett, City of Kingston Audit from KPMG, and Desiree Kennedy, City Treasurer. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I said seconded by me. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, would you like to speak to the motion to amend so we understand it? Yes, just in, in brief there, Your Worship. So basically this was uh, due to um, a communication which was provided uh, at the final hour kind of there from uh, Mr. Sean Fitzpatrick where it says, I regret to inform you that I will be unable to sit on any committee at this time due to a change in personal circumstances. I sincerely apologize for this late news, but I was not aware of this until today, Sean Fitzpatrick. Okay, thank you. Anyone wishes to speak to the amendment? Councillor Stroud? Just... Uh before we make this official. So does that leave one slot open for the nominations committee to fill at a future time then? Ask you, yes. <laughs> Councillor Baum? Yeah, uh, well, es essentially due to the time constraints, we wouldn't actually have time to meet and fill that. So we would now hold up that committee. So the idea was to just proceed with that, uh, with the amendment to basically compose the committee of those listed above. So the, this working group will have three members instead of four? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote then on the motion to amend. Please vote. And that carries on the clause as amended. We'll call the vote. One more, please. And that carries. Okay, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Information reports, if you have any questions, just please just raise your hand. Number one, immigration status update. And number two, nuisance party bylaw. Councillor Straub. Okay, Councillor Shell. Thank you. Not surprising that we've put up our hands. Um, just uh, the major one is, first, I'm, I'm in total support of this. I'm so pleased it's coming. Uh, in the cities that uh, had universities that introduced this, was it difficult to sort of get it going? I mean, it would be, what we have as problems is large parties, and if you have bylaw officers coming, uh, writing tickets. Did, did they have a lot of problems uh, implementing uh, a bylaw like this? And, you know, do you, do you have to think about safety and that sort of thing in implementing a bylaw of this type? Mr. McLean. Through you, Your Worship. The, the focus of this bylaw in terms of its implementation is it's, it's a tool for, first and foremost, for the police. And so we certainly in Kingston see it that way. Uh, that's been the practice in the uh, municipalities that we've uh, spoken to. Uh, the police lead the enforcement. This is a tool 
that they can use. Certainly byline enforcement officers, as they do now, uh, can uh, support the police in terms of uh, issuing a ticket. Um, but uh, often it's with uh, the police making the first contact with large parties. Um, on many occasions with uh, routine house parties, uh, if I can characterize them that way, our bylaw officers uh, are very capable of responding and enforcing the noise bylaw, for example. And that will continue. We envision that continuing. But in those instances where we have very large social gatherings, large nuisance parties, where uh, if bylaw officers respond, they would ask for police assistance anyway. And once police are on scene, the provisions of a nuisance bylaw could be invoked by the police if they deemed the situation to warrant it. So. Uh, from that perspective, from a safety perspective, we would let police lead the enforcement of a bylaw such as this, and bylaw officers would be there to support the police in terms of uh, issuing tickets at the direction of the police. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Um, yes, so I looked at this uh, closely, of course, with my district. Um, being one of the places where this might well conceivably be used, if passed. Um, I had a, an opportunity to speak to a member of staff uh, this morning about it, and I see he's just sat down beside the director. So maybe we could just go over the couple main points that you uh, explained that we discussed uh, about the, um, who is it that is given the authority if this uh, is passed, not, not tonight because this is an information report, but if we do come up with this type of bylaw, who uh, are we looking at being the decision maker for when to designate a party as uh, being a nuisance party? Like when would it apply and who would make that decision? Mr. Kelson. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so in the, the municipalities that we've been focusing on in our best practice review, uh, the City of London and the City of Guelph, they have a provision in uh, each of their bylaw that states that an officer of a certain rank uh, must make the declaration um, or determination uh, of a social gathering to be a nuisance party before the bylaw can be uh, used. Yes, great. And that sort of follows what Mr. McLean was saying. Uh, and then bylaw might be involved uh, if uh, fines were going to be uh, implemented, but it would be at the discretion of this certain ranking officer. That, I found that to be a very helpful um, explanation. And the other aspect is, of course, the uh, fear that some may have, and, and it's up to me to raise this because I do represent thousands of student residents. Um, it, any type of bylaw that seems to be narrowly focused on one demographic uh, to the point of people thinking that they're being targeted or profiled would be, uh, I would say to be avoided. So what types of things are we seeing in the in other municipalities uh, and what types of, like what um, scope would this bylaw have that where, you know, the residents, uh, especially the university students, wouldn't feel like this bylaw is specifically targeting them? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The way that uh, the bylaw is structured, it, it is a citywide bylaw, so it applies to all neighborhoods um, in the cities that it is uh, in effect in London and in Guelph. Um, so it, it, is a, it is applied to the entire city and it is enforced um, as such. Okay, that's all my questions. Okay, seeing no other questions, we will move on. Thank you. Uh, no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business, we do have one motion that as requested by Kingston Interval House, 
The council proclaimed November 2017 as Women Abuse Awareness Month in the city of Kingston. Can I have a mover moved by Councillor Holland, seconded by Councillor Osanek? Please vote. And that carries. On to new motions. Number one, moved by Councillor George, seconded by Mayor Patterson. Whereas Ontarians identify infrastructure and transit as the biggest problems facing their municipal government, and Ontarians already pay the highest property taxes in the country. And whereas municipalities have limited authority to make changes that are needed to reduce the cost of delivering municipal services and financing infrastructure projects. And whereas a 10-year projection, 2016 to 2025, of municipal expenditures against inflationary property tax and user fee increases show there to be an unfunded average annual need of $4.9 billion to fix local infrastructure and provide for municipal operating needs. And whereas this gap calculation presumes all existing and multi-year planned federal and provincial transfers to municipal governments will be fulfilled, and whereas each municipal government in Ontario faces unique issues, fiscal health is a challenge shared by all municipal governments regardless of size, and whereas diversifying municipal revenues strengthens municipal long-term infrastructure planning and financing and will reduce the vulnerability of municipal governments to any federal or provincial changes in their own respective fiscal health. And whereas a 1% increase to the provincial portion of the HST adjusted for low-income rebates would result in about $2.5 billion in new revenue would be distributed equitably to help every municipal government on Ontario fund their infrastructure and services with greater predictability. Whereas Kingston collects an annual 1% property tax levy that goes towards infrastructure investment, repair and re rehabilitation in the community. Therefore be resolved that Kingston City Council support the Association of Municipalities of Ontario in its efforts to secure this new source of revenue to help fund critical municipal services like roads, bridges, transit, clean water and other services. And that should AMO's local share policy to increase the HST be adopted and legislated by the Ontario government, then the City of Kingston would remove the 1% capital infrastructure tax levy to reflect this new annual stream of revenue into the City's capital budget. Councillor George, you have the floor. Thank you, Worship, and uh, through you, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Matthew Wilson very much for attending this evening and uh, providing some much-needed information for this Council and others in attendance this evening, and especially those viewing from home, to get a better understanding of where we are uh, with our current uh, infrastructure deficit right across the province of Ontario. And as Matthew mentioned, this has been in the works with AMO now for a few years, a couple of years anyways, and we've had some great committee the whole uh, meetings uh, in Toronto to discuss this on many occasions and take a look at uh, all the potential opportunities that could exist out there to assist us. Um, I didn't think before I came this evening to count the number of budgets I've sat through in this chamber and have listened to uh, previously uh, Jim Keach of Utilities Kingston talk about the infrastructure challenges that we face here in Kingston. And it's not only the old city of Kingston anymore, it's, it's extended now into the former Pittsburgh Township, former Kingston Township. And um, because the infrastructure's been there for 30, 40 years now, and it, there are there are needs in, in those communities now uh, where we need to see upgrades to the facilities. Uh, and we're recognizing a lot of those through our wastewater uh, improvement uh, uh, plans that are in place and uh, that we have, uh, have, have uh, approved uh, for those expenditures over the last couple of terms. But there is a need to address the future and what we've been hearing loud and clear, not only here, but right across the province, is the fact that people are sick and tired of recognizing a continued increase in their taxes on the residential tax base. And even though we've been very good at trying to hold the line here in Kingston at 2.5% each and every year, we still continue to hear from those that are struggling and that 2.5% uh, is not good enough. But the fact is we have a city to run and we have uh, we have a, uh, a duty to make sure that you know the infrastructure that's in place is is what's required to run a, a city not only safely uh, so we don't have any 
Walkerton experiences and that type of thing in the future, but that we have roads that can be safely traveled and that we have, uh, you know, fire vehicles and, and uh, EMS vehicles and, and all these types of things that we currently fund through development charges is one thing that we've done of late, which is assisting with some of those purchases. But to think about what we could do if the government was in a position to provide us with the funding that we actually need. Um, it's, it's been a challenge and, you know, the, the fact is, as was pointed out by Councillor Oosterhoff earlier, all three party leaders at this point in time have indicated they are not willing to discuss this particular option that AMO is putting forward. But what I see from coming from this is that if we all stand together and we make it very clear to either the, both the current government and potentially a new government next year, they're going to have to make a decision on how they're going to assist us and how they're going to help us fund these infrastructure challenges that we all face. If it isn't going to be a 1% HST increase, then what are they going to offer? You know, they have to put their thinking caps on and start realizing that the municipalities cannot afford to continue to tax people that are their homes. We heard from Matthew that the province of Ontario is the highest taxed, residential taxed province in, in, in this country. And, uh, you know, there comes a time when you have to say enough's enough. So we need to put these provincial leaders on the hot spot. We need to have them formulate some way which they can sell us on that is going to assist us in funding the challenges that we're facing because it's not gonna get any easier. 30 seconds. And so we need, we need to send a strong message. I believe that this is a start. This may not be the perfect plan, but at least it's one that we've put a lot of thought, a lot of effort into it. And we are hoping that if anything, it forces their hand, it forces them to find some solution to assist us. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll sit down and, and allow uh, some other questions. Okay. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, I heard that this is not exactly a perfect plan, and I do have some concerns with the last that statement. Um, and it's asking us to remove the 1% capital infrastructure if this gets applied. And um, just uh, my understanding was that when we take a tool off the table, even if it's being replaced by something else, we're losing a certain flexibility. Um, is that true still? Ms. Kennedy. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so yes, that is true. So the 1% the capital levy is, is a, um, an integral component of a much broader uh, modeling that we have or funding strategies that we have around capital. So uh, including things like the extent of our capital reserve fund balances, um, debt balances and our strategies around debt are all part of that as well. Uh, so certainly that, that's one component of a large, and, you, and, and I would suggest we don't look at that in isolation, that you have to look at the broader model and what the effect of that would mm -hmm. be. And may I ask, have we looked at the broader model yet, if this were to be implemented? Like, has staff thought this through, or does staff need some time to actually inform itself and us of the ramifications of this and the removal of the 1% uh, immediately? Ms. Kennedy? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have not done a lot of analysis at this point in time, so um, certainly a lot of unanswered questions that, uh, that we'd want to build into that analysis around things like uh, certainly the amount, how it would be cash flowed, when it would start, um, any kinds of restrictions on the dollars and how they would be used, um, operating maintenance versus capital maintenance, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of outstanding information that we would need to start to do a, a, an analysis and bring some further detail back to Council. Thank you. And um, just last question. Um, I was also taught that uh, we shouldn't be committing a future Council to any particular course of action, and I suspect this might take more than a year. Um, it seems inappropriate to decide this now, like to remove that capital uh, tax levy if we get this, and I think that it requires a little bit more time and a little bit more thought. So um, I'd like to move an amendment that we remove the last, that clause, if I can have a seconder. 
Mr. Stroud. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was there a seconder? Councillor Stroud. Seconded by Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Okay, so there is an amendment that's been put forward by Councillor McLaren. It's been moved uh, and seconded by Councillor Stroud. Uh, do you wish to speak to it? So to the amendment, uh, it sounds like um, we're losing a little bit of flexibility if we do this right now. Staff haven't thought this through yet and haven't had the opportunity to think this through, so I think it's premature to remove it. And if this takes more than a year, we really shouldn't be committing a future council to doing this without letting them decide uh, the merits of keeping it or removing it. Thank you. Okay, so on the amendment, Councillor Bohm. Thanks, Your Worship, and through you, without uh, in recognizing the time, without belaboring this to death, I, I, I'm going to support the amendment. I think it's something where we're not really sure what we'd be losing with the one percent uh, infrastructure tax levy. We're not even sure this is going to go through. So, you know, kind of presupposing all that and not really knowing exactly where this is going to go, removing it at this point, it's always something we could add back in. So, in recognition of time, I'll support it and let's move. Thank you, Councillor George. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I don't know, for people who want to try and save the taxpayers some money, we're not given a lot of consideration to with what I've just heard. But um, I think what I would prefer, if, if they're really want, uh, concerned with that, um, I think you might be able to simply wordsmith a little that the city of Kingston would give consideration to the removal of the 1% capital infrastructure rather than taking the whole thing and throwing it out. Um, I, I mean, the whole point behind doing this is to take the burden off the residential taxpayer. You know, you got to get your head around that. Um, people are sick and tired of it. So I think if, if there was consideration to that, in fact, I, I would move that is because I can, if I believe, can I do an okay. amendment? Okay, so, so I'm just, I'm just going to stop you there. So I have five hands that just went up, and I'm not sure if that's because people think that that's probably a good idea. So I'm going to have two, two options. So we can't amend this. Uh, we eventually have to either withdraw it or vote it down, and then we could put forward that friendly amendment. So uh, I'm going to look to, to Council McLaren, first of all, to see if he is willing to withdraw that First Amendment based on what Councillor George has put forward. You don't have to. If you want to keep it forward, then we can vote on it. So or, <laughs> if, the, if there's hesitation, that's fine. So we can, we'll leave it on the floor. Councillor McLaren? <laughs> Okay, so I needed. Okay, so in the absence of an answer from Councilor McLaren, it's still on the floor. So, Councilor George, you've you've made that point, but to be clear, we can't amend this. Um, to do that, we'll have to vote against this amendment, and then there'll be an opportunity to put that amendment forward. I can live with that, and I would just encourage people to vote against it, give it some some thought, because if we just amend this, that based on what happens in the future, where it's up to staff to give us direction on whether we continue with the 1% or whether, depending on what may or may not happen, there's another means by which that money can be distributed to cover this. So, And I, I do have an issue with, you know, putting something in place that's burdening another council. We do that all the time. <laughs> it's a given. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. Okay, so I'm just going to echo what Councillor George has said. This is this is a symbolic motion of support. This is like hypothetical, big time, because quite frankly, the province has said we're not interested in doing this. So this is definitely this is years away. So the intention of that last clause, and and I will I will say that that was my idea, because. I felt it was important to send a signal to Kingston residents that this is not about an add-on to your tax bill, this is about changing the mix. So if it's gonna go up in one, it's gotta go down in another. It's just about sending that signal. It's not about doing all that analysis and committing to something that may or may not happen several years from now. So I think the idea 
of voting against this amendment and then putting forward a new amendment that would just simply add wording like that we consider, so we're not locked in and we're not suggesting that we are, I think is by far the preferred solution. To the point where I don't think I could support this motion without some sort of statement that would suggest that we would look for that offset. So I'm just going to echo that comment. So again, I'd encourage council to vote against this amendment so we can put another one forward. Thank you. And I return the chair. Thank you, okay. So because there were five hands that all went up, I, I lost who was first. So I think first time I list is Councillor Candon, then I have Councillor Stroud, and then Counts and then Deputy Mayor Neal. Councillor Candon. Thank you, and through you, I guess I just want to reiterate that's this my I have similar logic in the sense that if we're going to be saying we're we're raising a tax, we have to be reducing a tax. We're we're allocating it in a, in a different way. I'm not sure if other municipalities are raising or how many municipalities are raising their tax uh, residential taxes one percent a year as we are. Um, but if we're creating a safety net or coming up with a different strategy to uh, solve our problems, that one statement stating that we will at the very least be tying the two together, raising one and lowering the other. It's kind of holding us accountable as counselors as to why we're doing things. Otherwise, the message to the public will be, we're just raising your taxes. Whereas we're reallocating and coming up with a strategy to offset uh, a large deficit that we're about to uh, walk into. There's a strategy behind it and the whole thing is tied to our 1% uh, residential tax. So if we increase the uh, uh, from 13 to 14 percent and then we continue to keep raise people's residential taxes, we're just we're just throwing money away. Uh, so it's it's important that we tie those two together. like if if those two aren't tied together, I wouldn't be able to support this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Council I Stroud, I, I believe, was ahead of me oh, I'm when sorry. you Did read the sorry. before. I, I got the li uh, list um, misordered. So, Councillor Stroud. All right. So, you have to be able to separate the two clauses in your mind, at least, to be able to get your head around what they're saying. So, let's just look at them again. So, this is, first of all, we're discussing an amendment, correct? Mm -hmm. So, the amendment is to cut the... Uh, the motion in half and and uh, cut the second half off, right? So this, what does the second half say? Well, the part that I don't like about it, I agree with Councilor McLaren, is we're binding ourselves without really having done the analysis to the removal of the 1% capital levy, which our um, Utilities Kingston CEO has often uh, mentioned as one of our, you know, trump cards that we have here in Kingston, this this 1% capital levy that, uh, that have, has been in place for quite some time and that we depend on for a lot of work. So you have to be able to separate it in your mind. And then even though we're talking about the amendment, be, because everyone else has talked about how they tie together, just read what the first clause says. It says that Kingston City Council support the association at AMO in its efforts to secure this new source of revenue to fund critical municipal services. Okay. So it doesn't actually say in the clause that we are asking for a tax increase. It says that we support AMO in its effort to secure this new source of revenue. So that, as we've heard from his worship, is, is far from a done deal. So in the meantime, it, I think it'd be very foolish to give up on the 1% levy until we've got more uh, analysis, more information. And final point, the HST is collected provincially. The, uh, the tax levy, uh, the property tax levy for infrastructure is collected here by our property taxes municipally, right? So that's really the only thing we should be talking about. We shouldn't really be tying them together. I know the perception will be that, oh, you're raising taxes, you can't raise taxes. The, the, the truth is we can really only affect the property tax, uh, which is within our control. So that's the second clause. So we shouldn't be jumping to conclusions, and that's why I support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. 
Very quickly, I will be voting against the amendment as it now stands. I've never said these words before. Councillor George is brilliant. Uh, Jim, <laughs> I moved and Rob seconded a motion, uh, an amendment I was going to bring forward to do exactly what he's proposing, which I think recognizes what we're empowered to do and what we're not empowered to do. And frankly, I wanna see the four-year capital budget before I get rid of the 1% uh, capital levy. So for that reason, I'm voting against the amendment. I think the proposed amendment would be better. Thank you. Just before I move to the next speaker, it is 1041. I'm looking for a motion to extend the meeting, please. Moved by Counts Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hutchison to complete the agenda. The end of the agenda. Thank you. Please vote. One more, please. And that carries. Next on my list is Councillor Holland. This is again is just to the amendment. Thank you, Worship. Just a question, just to clarify before making this decision, knowing that there is another amendment in the works. Um, I'm just a little bit confused about what this increase in HST, how, so how it relates, what it would cover in relation to the capital levy. So for example, if we were to secure this funding, it talks about municipal services like roads, bridges, transit, and we hear often that um, transit costs, so they, they run on the roads, which is capital, the buses are capital, but the operating costs of transit are not covered by the capital levy. So an investment in transit, as an example, isn't, isn't laid out, I guess the question is, would that entire invest, would the investment in transit include all of the uh, aspects of transit or do we have any say over that? Okay, oh, uh, Ms. Kennedy, do you want to, or? I, I, who, who would like to answer? I can give it a try there. I, basically, I don't know. I don't think we have enough detail, but I think that's a very good question. Um, until we know a little more detail as potentially what that funding could be for. Um, and, and are we talking uh, asset management type costs, like what our 1% goes towards? Are we talking new assets like expanded transit, um, which then has an operating cost effect to it as well? So until we have the details, I, I'm not sure that we'd, uh, we'd have the answer to that. Councillor George. Thank you, Worship, and through you. Uh, the intent is that this new influx of funding, if it comes in, would cover everything save and accept operational related costs. So if you have an operational component, which we do each and every budget, which runs about 1.4, 1.5%, that money's still going to have to be collected separately. That, month, that increase is not going to disappear. This is strictly offsetting all those costs associated with capital, capital projects. So infrastructure, the purchase of vehicles, that type of thing. So then in that case, given that we are one of, I, th I think, only a few municipalities who have this capital levy system in place, which we've heard from the CAO is very important, has been important to us, what we're really asking for with these final two clauses is that the province raise the taxes in the form of HST to cover what we're already paying for through our capital levy. And, and more, it would cover more than that. I just, and our treasurer can correct me if I'm wrong, but currently with the 1% tax levy that we charge now, we bring in about $2 million a year. As you saw from the presentation that Matthew gave, we would be looking at over $24 million per year based on the current households that we presently have. As we continue to grow, as other municipalities continue to see their growth, that number would, would, would increase provided that, as Councillor McLaren brought up during the presentation, you know, the market still bears the, 
the, the, the spending by tourists and you know the economy is still doing well in Canada, then we would continue to see that. Otherwise it would drop, I, I can't for the life of me see it dropping dramatically, but it would certainly continue to exceed what we're collecting today. So we would be able to uh, fulfill our commitments. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the amendment only? Councillor McLaren, you have the last word. Just to say that we don't need to do this now. It really doesn't need to be a tied to anything. We have other taxes that we can tax, and uh, we can tie it to that, and it should be thought about more thoroughly before it goes through. Thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote then on the amendment to remove the final action clause. Please vote. And that loses by a vote of three to nine. So we're now back to the original motion as not amended. Deputy Mayor Neal. Oh, Councillor McLaren, yes, you still have the floor. I'm sorry. You have, you, have, um, you have three minutes left on the clock. Thank you. Okay, so um, I still have some other problems with this uh, in total. From what I'm still on the floor. So I... Point of order. Point Five order. minutes was on. Oh, you're saying you went back to the original motion. So we're now there. back on the okay. original clock, Councillor Hutchison. Yeah. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. So I still have some problems with this. Based on what the uh, presenta presenter said, most of this money is going to come from uh, the places that already have the highest GDP or that are producing the most, including cities. This means cities are going to be paying for this. So it seems that it's unequitable in the sense that Kingston will be paying out more than it's collecting in. So although we may be getting 24 million, it may be costing us 30 million or 26 million or 36 million. That's a loss, a dead loss to the community. And it's a particularly dead loss for economic development because it's people, incomes, that determine primarily the growth of economic development. Infrastructure is a facilitator, a secondary beneficiary. And in that sense, we may be, without proper details, shooting ourselves in the foot. We, are, uh, we could be being bribed, essentially, by $24 million, $26 million, but it's going to cost us more than that. Why? Because we're a city. It's the, this is essentially, basically, to help uh, the rural, and there may be other ways to do this. Uh, so I can't really support supporting this without a lot more details. Now, and to answer the question as to what, if not this, what else? May I suggest that perhaps municipalities should have access to the income tax pool? Because I think that's a progressive tax. This is still regressive. When we're talking about uh, HST, it is paid for by um, those who are lowest on the income ladder mostly, they, they, as a proportion of their income. Those who are higher up on the income ladder tend to spend their money outside of the province on trips to Cuba or something like that, where we do not collect that income. This is, we're paying for infrastructure from the people who are least able to afford it in the, in the greatest proportion, and that makes it regressive. If we were to change this and ask for a income tax, an access to the income tax pool, that would be a progressive idea. I think this is going in the wrong direction, and uh, there are better solutions out there. I know that uh, uh, many people disagree, but in that respect, I'm not gonna be able to support this. Okay, thank you. Next on my list is Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. Um, I uh, support this initiative. Uh, I, if we can just remember that when, I believe the federal government shared uh, a little bit of gas re tax revenue with us, much of the infrastructure that has com come about uh, both transit and roads came from that uh, small largesse that we got uh, from, from the federal government and it enables us to, to address some of our, our capital uh, deficit. So I see this in a similar way and I would argue that this is, um, yes, it's a regressive tax, HST. Property tax is a regressive tax. The only way that we could ever get rid of 
uh, those forms of regressive taxation is if we were able to eliminate them all and do an income tax. But the upper tiers of government keep income tax very close to their chest and don't want to share that initiative with, with municipalities. Uh, so for that reason, I support this initiative, uh, but I would like to bring forward uh, a, an amendment, if I might, duly moved and seconded and given a nod by the person who spoke to this earlier. Uh, so we request to amend the final resolve clause to read, the city of Kingston would consider removal of the 1% capital infrastructure tax levy. And if okay. I so it's uh, moved and seconded, um, seconded by Councillor Hutchison. Seconded by Councillor Hutchison. I think everyone understands what the amendment is. I think we've already somewhat debated it. Um, so I'm just trying to speed things up a little bit. That being said, the amendment is on the floor. Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you. Uh, I think this amendment is much cleaner than than not having that wording. Because the reality is that I wouldn't be able to vote for that final resolve clause in absence of knowing what our four-year capital plan is without input on what it, you know what we uh, need. And if we, indeed we do get 24 million, then this would definitely, for a future council be a consideration but I I want to say when I go to when I've been to FCM conferences in the past and when I've been to AMO conferences and events in the past and I mention our one percent uh, infrastructure levy it's almost universally embraced by other other municipalities, other elected officials saying, ooh, I wish we could do that. Because the infrastructure uh, deficit isn't just a Kingston phenomenon. It's right across the province. So if, if, and this, that levy is the only way we've been able to address that over the years. And so I wouldn't want to suggests that if we get this, we automatically get rid of that without more information. Uh, so I'm hopeful that, that the amendment will pass. Thank you. Anybody else to the amendment? Councillor Straub? I'm going to vote against the amendment because I think it's actually worse to to leave, to leave wiggle room where you say consider uh, giving, to, sort of giving, keeping both options, sitting on the fence, if, as it were, but bringing up the subject to the taxpayer. Um, removing it was clear. Uh, saying consider removing it is not clear. I don't like that lack of clarity, and so I won't be supporting it. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison? Um, on that point, the, the, it really moved. <laughs> There's a. I'm. I'm going to support this guy. I did second it, <laughs> for one thing, but and uh, I think there's a number of really serious considerations on both sides of this uh, issue. Uh, the one thing is uh, is what you one, what was meant by remove, uh, and that means like, do we stop levying the capital, one uh, percent to stop. Don't, don't apply it from, I don't know, the next year to and thereafter? Or are we actually removing the money that we previously have raised? Remember, right now, we're, um, I look at the treasure here, but we're raising about 24 million, I think. Is that not correct? Uh, through Your Worship, uh, about 30 million. About 30 now. million, okay. Over the years we've been doing this, which is a great initiative, and uh, so we're getting 30 million now. I don't think this means we're going to give that what we were already raising every year up. At least I hope it doesn't because we're probably going to need it. 
And uh, so consider allows us to think about that as well, use that verb, okay? And so on, 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 the, on the basis of, um, of that, I, um, I, I, I think I'll, I'll continue to support the, uh, the, the amendment suggested by Councillor Neal. I think it's just uh, a prudent thing to do. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll call the vote then on the motion to amend. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of nine to three. Okay, on the motion as amended, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Uh, Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I'm sorry, Councillor oh. Holland, I forgot. I did this the last time too. Uh, Deputy Mayor Neal, sorry, you do still have two minutes left on the Thank clock. you, I won't take two minutes. I just wanna remind people that uh, all the argument that sales tax is regressive, let's keep in mind that we are indeed a tourist town. And when people come to Kingston and spend money in Kingston, that money uh, we collect uh, we collect sales tax on. So, uh, so whether it's more regressive or less regressive than property tax is a long debate. Sorry, Councillor Holland, you have the floor. Thank you, I feel I've been preempt somewhat, uh, preempted somewhat. So, um, yes, I believe this is a regressive tax. <laughs> And uh, I'm not supporting it for that reason, not just that reason. I mean, I think what we're, what we're, yeah, it would be neat and really clean and lovely if we, and very politically um, savvy of us to propose that we find a way to get the province to give us more money to cover some of the very, the many, many items that we have on our wish list as a municipality and for all municipalities. And I, I, I completely agree that there's a shortfall. It needs to, we need, the province needs to be considering the municipalities more, more than they've ever done before. Um, the, and whether or not this is the right route, uh, I think we've already seen it with the, uh, as Councillor Oosterhoff mentioned earlier, the fact that all three political parties are, are not supporting this they're not supporting it because we're asking them to raise taxes. And they won't support it, and we won't see this, we won't see this come to fruition. That's not why I'm not supporting it. Uh, I'm just trying to point out the fact that we're asking, if we were to ask the province to give us, to, to raise taxes, to raise the HST in order to reduce hydro bills, for example, uh, or to pay for childcare or for schools, these are, public services and initiatives and, and, and services in, in general that I think are just as important as investing in infrastructure. And, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to put forward a somewhat realistic argument to say that this proposal isn't as neat and clean as we think it might be. Even if it were to be for us, there are, there are reasons for that tax and Many of them have to do with addressing the social inequity that we see in this province, and I don't want to see, uh, I don't want to see, see the the province necessarily be in a position where they're raising taxes. Um, that, where we're asking them to consider only the needs of the municipality of municipalities in this one percent, and of course, it's arguable who pays for what and who benefits from what. But I just, I simply don't think this is the way forward. Mostly because, uh, based on the principle that it is a regressive tax. Thanks. Thank you. And Councillor Hutchison, I believe, was next. Oh, okay. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Councillor George for doing his representation at AMO um, and presenting this because this has been on our municipal plates for, I can't remember how long, but it's a very long time, 25 years probably at least. And um, so finally, you know, obviously even municipalities couldn't agree about this. So finally we've got, we're getting someplace and we're 
try and present a united front. So this, this can only be a good thing. And um, on the other hand, I think Councilor McLaren raises some really good points about, you know, does it work out? Whether this, uh, the money leaving is the same as the money that we retain and how, how it's spent, this, this is, and, and how it affects economic development. This is a, a serious consideration as well. And I also point out that one of the insecurities with this particular proposal is that getting the 1% HST is a provincial decision, and he who gives can also take away. One of the big advantages of leveling our own 1% infrastructure taxes, we control that. And we were not even talking about myself or any, well, maybe Councillor George and Neil, but nothing, you know, we were smart enough as a city to do it back in 97, 98 in there. And so, you know, we're in a, a, a much, much better position than we would have been and, and relative to other municipalities because of it. However, um, and as I said previously, it really matters what you mean by remove, right? <laughs> if we're just going to stop increasing by 1% a year, then that's, that probably works. But if we're talking about giving up the money we already take in in order to balance it off with the $24.7 million, which is less than we're taking in, we're taking in $30 million, and with the insecurity of wondering whether the province is going to stick to its guns and give us that money, then I don't see it as such a great deal. But you can't get anywhere unless you can form some kind of solidarity with other municipalities. And hopefully we can go forward. And frankly, removing the money from our budget would be our decision. And hopefully we're smart enough to hold on to it. So I'll vote for this and um, encourage other people to do so as well. On, because on balance, it's probably moving in the right direction. I'll return the chair. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the motion as amended? Councillor Strout. Thanks, Your Worship. I just have two things to say, and I don't belabor the point. 24 million divided by 120,000, to use a round number of our population, is $20. Um, and it's also less than the 30 million that our treasurer has told us we are raising with our 1% capital, uh, capital levy. So we're, we're in over our heads here with this. I, I, we've, it's, our treasurer's already told us that the analysis has not been done. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're playing with fire here. Um, we're chasing rainbows. We think, we think that this is somehow moving in the right direction. That, based on the assumption that the infrastructure gap is whatever number we were told in the presentation. There is no, um, that assumption itself is, uh, is just that, it's an assumption. We, as a society, forget as a city council, as a society, we're f faced with some very tough choices these days with when it comes to sustainability. That's a word that was used several times in the presentation. Um, the infrastructure cost is not sustainable. Well, I would agree. Uh, uh, some infrastructure costs are not sustainable. That, I think we would all agree, some infrastructure costs are not sustainable. Some, not all, some we need to do, like doing the sewers, redoing the sewers for the city of Kingston, we have to do whether, it's just, whether we can afford it or not. It's, it's not a choice. It's like when your roof needs fixing, you have to do it. Some of our choices, though, are choices that we don't have to do. We don't have to do all of the infrastructure improvements uh, that are proposed. And that's where we're letting our taxpayers down. We're making some bad choices. And then we're not able to pay for them. Everybody does that at some point. You buy a car that's too expensive or something. We need to make those choices first. That's something we can control. The truth is, the future of the planet is dependent on choices and to keep saying we've got to raise taxes to pay for the bad decisions we've already made is backwards. The best thing to do is to, if we want to ch change something here in Kingston, next time we're talking about a large project, let's think of the cost. Seven of you 
here supported, well, not Councilor Howden because he's gone, supported keeping taxes at 2.5% strategic planning. Half of us did not. We didn't think we could maintain it. And now here we are talking about a 1% HST increase. So think about that. I am against this, this whole thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor George, you have the last word. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. I don't think there's much more I can add. I, I appreciate the, the support that some members of council have been showing in this endeavor. Um, I mean, there's a lot of very intelligent individuals that have uh, been working on this for the last two years. Um, and uh, some of these numbers are not assumed numbers. They are hard numbers that they've gathered and put together in order to be able to put forward a, an argument that if it's challenged by the province, it can be proven. Those are the numbers. Um, it's just giving us another alternative for consideration. And as I said early on, it's, it could also be an attempt, uh, and I'm only speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the board here, but in my view too, it's, it may force the hand of whoever the government is going to be that's formed next year following the election to do something to help us out. And this may not be what they approve, but if we send some kind of message to them to say we need something done, at least we're doing it as Councillor Hutchison pointed out, we're doing it as a, as a group now. It's not just little single municipalities saying help me, help me. We're out there working as a team to send a message that we're all in the same boat. And so uh, I certainly hope you will support it. Um, it's, it's not a guarantee by any means. And I totally agree that with the 1% that's currently there, it's gonna be a future council. We'll have to make a decision on that. And the taxpayers are gonna let them know what they wanna do, I'm sure, because they're certainly gonna hear, I'm sure, the same complaints that we hear today. But uh, anyways, uh, I'll leave it at that, Your Worship. I think enough's been said, and I hope that you will give consideration to supporting this. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote then on new motion number one as amended. And that carries by a vote of nine to three. New motion number two, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Neal. Whereas equal pay for equal work is a just concern that improves the equity of people in the local economy, and whereas secure employment is better than precarious employment for individual finance and community economic development, and whereas a prolonged labor conflict will detrimentally affect many ancillary jobs and the future prospects of many students, and whereas this labor conflict costs the economy of Kingston about $182,186 per day in direct income loss, salaries, wages, and benefits, plus its multiplier, uh, therefore, be it resolved that Kingston City Council add their voice to the growing list of people and institutions who call for the Government of Ontario to find an equitable and just agreement with the Colleges of Ontario, and that this resolution be shared with Kathleen Wynne, Premier of Ontario, Kevin Flynn, Minister of Labour, Deb Matthews, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development, Sophie Kawala, our MPP, and the opposition party leaders and critics. Councillor McLaren, you have the floor. Thank you. This is a uh, particularly important one for Kingston because education is both a consumption good and an investment good. It has a high-powered multiplier in that sense. It benefits us now and in the future. And these are the people who are making Kingston run. Most of the people who get jobs coming out of St. Lawrence stay in Kingston compared to other institutions. We are holding them back, or they are being held back as long as this labor dispute continues. And this is doubly bad for Kingston because on the economic development side, these people are not entering the workforce as early as they would be otherwise. The money is not being spent in Kingston and it comes with a high multiplier effect. The money that is spent by one person in Kingston gets spent, it gets traded in for somebody else's income then they spend it again and they spend it again. Education is high in that regard, and this one particularly benefits Kingston because, again, these people stay here, which is what we want. And the second thing is that we're looking at a little bit of economic justice here um, and social justice. There are people in the, universe, in the college who are in precarious situations where they can only keep or they only have a guarantee of their job for a particular semester. They don't have the, the wherewithal to plan properly for their future 
and that is hurtful for both individual, psychological, financial, and personal relationships within them, but it's also hurtful for the economic development of Kingston because it's incomes and guaranteed or consistent incomes that is what is, that helps develop a, 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 an economy. And in that sense, this one is particularly bad because the people are here. There are people and we are the closest to them as municipal employees. And this is why we're, I'm pulling, I am put this motion in because it affects our people more than it does uh, anybody else. And for that reason, I'm hoping that you will send a message uh, to the provincial government that we need this solved and quickly because people's lives are being put on hold. Students' futures are being put on hold. Student loans are still occurring. And it's, it's just not good for anybody. And in that sense, I hope that you guys will all consider sending this message. Oh, and another thing, yeah. Um, the latest news that I heard is that the, uh, the bargaining um, has, in a sense, broken down. They forced a vote on a proposal that was rejected previously. And we're getting close to a very, to the um, point of no return where this entire semester could be lost. And so it's critically important that it be done now as opposed to next council session. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. So I agree with Councillor McLaren on several points. There's no question that this strike is a big concern to the community. There's no question it's a concern for students that aren't in classes. I have no issues or concerns whatsoever that, that this is, uh, that we all want a resolution to the ongoing labor, uh, labor dispute as quickly as possible. I also believe, and I think everyone can agree with this, that in any labor dispute, there are two sides. And we can talk about which side is right and which side is wrong, but I believe that it is incredibly important in a very tense and difficult labor dispute that if we say anything, that we shouldn't take a side. My concern is that the motion that is presented in the rationale is taking one side, and I'm not arguing against that side. I think it's a legitimate side, but there's also another side. We're an order of government here. We need to be careful how we communicate. Now, if you don't want to be concerned about that, there are other avenues for you to be able to express your views. You can put together a Facebook page or in a Twitter account, as many of us do, and you can tweet to your heart's content what you think the right answer is. But we're a level of government here, and St. Lawrence College is an important institution. So I think it's important how we communicate. So for that reason, I have a motion to amend that I would like to put forward, what I think would be the minimum condition for me to be able to support this. So there are two pieces. The first is to delete the two first two whereas clauses. Not because what they're saying is wrong, but in the context of what we're talking about, they're loaded. In the same way as if I was to have a whereas clause that said, whereas efficiencies and cost savings are very important. Well, no one's gonna disagree with that, but that's loaded. That's clearly aligning to, to one side or the other. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is I have no idea what the action clause is saying. The action clause as written is saying that we would ask for the government of Ontario to find an agreement with the colleges, but the dispute is between the colleges and the faculty. So I don't even understand what that means. So before we send something off to the provincial government, we should have clarity on what it is we're trying to say. So I'm proposing something very simple that would just say that we urge a speedy resolution to the current labor dispute. And I think everyone can agree on that. So I would propose voting for this, then we can pass the amendment unanimously. So I don't have a seconder lined up, I'm just throwing that out, but if there's a seconder, um, thank you. So I, I see Councillor Bohm has offered to, to second that, so I'm asking Council to support this motion to amend so that we can send the statement that this is important to the community, we urge a speedy resolution, but let's do it in the right way, we're not sending a, a wrong signal to either side. Thank you. I return the chair and raise my hand. Can I request that so, these be split? So you, can't so you can't return the chair to me because it's my motion to amend that's on the floor. 
So if you can retain the chair, you can give it to somebody I will else. retain the chair, thank you. And I'll pass it on to Councillor Holland. I take the chair and I recognize you. And my request was to separate the two clauses for voting purposes. Uh, so, okay, uh, we will vote on the two, does that mean I keep the chair for the vote? Okay, so we're gonna vote on the two clauses of this amendment. Um, the f and by that I mean the first that clause of this amendment separate from the second that clause of this amendment. Call the vote. Great. Oh, sorry, on the first one. We're calling the vote on the first part of the amendment. Oh, right, okay. Why are you waving at me? <laughs> Councillor Hutchison? Okay, I see what the mayor's trying to do, and I sort of understand what he's saying, but I also appreciate the motion, so I've got a bit of a quandary here. The, I would say that the oddity about removing the first two clauses is that this is the same provincial government that says it's gonna do something about precarious employment. So here's their chance, do what you say. So, of course, precarious employment is much broader than this, um, but um, I find it kind of ironic. Um, <clears throat> though I understand where the mayor's going, I'm not you know, that foolish. I, I don't, oh, and we're just we're talking about the first two whereas clauses at the moment, mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Okay, fine, that's all I've gotta say about that. It's, if we remove it, um, I mean, they're clearly addressed to the province, those two whereas clauses, and they are in charge here, make no mistake. The employer council, or council is a function of the province. There's no getting around that. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else on the first clause of the amendment? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. Oh, sorry, and that um, passes by vote of eight to four. So calling now, or sorry, on to the next part, the next clause of this amendment. Anyone wish to speak? Uh, Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, I'm reluctantly going to support this uh, because it's housekeeping, it is realistic, uh, it's the same firewall that the province does in education, it's never there, it's never the province that underfunds boards of education and then if there's a strike says, well, throws their hands up and say, says it's not us, uh, you have to deal with your Board of Education. And so the, it's accurate to say that the original resolve clause is really asking the government of Ontario to do something that they've delegated to somebody else to do. Uh, so I will support this particular amendment. Thank you. Anyone else, else wish to speak on this part of the amendment? Okay, seeing none, call the question. One more, please. And that passes unanimously. Do I return the chair for the rest of the Deputy Mayor Neal? Okay, so I'm returning the chair to Deputy Mayor Neal for the discussion on the main motion. Uh, you, you can return it to me if you if Right, you like. back, to, back to you. Thank you. So we're now on the uh, motion as amended. Uh, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Seeing none. We will call the vote then on the motion as amended. Please vote. And that carries. New motion number three, moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Stroud. Whereas several cities in North America have adopted bicycle boulevards, sometimes referred to as neighborhood greenways, particularly in university districts, and whereas Alfred Street, Frontenac Street, and Albert Street are identified as green streets in city planning documents, and whereas a bicycle-safe, low-speed, and quiet street connecting Princess Street with Queen's main campus would be most appreciated by residents, pedestrians, and cycle commuters alike, 
and whereas city staff and consultants are currently working on an active transportation master plan. Therefore, be it resolved that serious consideration be given to a possible bike boulevard on one of the aforementioned green streets, particularly Frontenac Street, and that a report from staff with recommendations be presented at an Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee meeting early in Q2 2018, at which time a public meeting will be held to seek community input. Deputy Mayor Neal, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I won't repeat uh, what the two delegations spoke towards. I think uh, there's broad support in the community and particularly in Williamsville area for this. I will, uh, the first time that I heard about uh, bike boulevards, I believe was at the, uh, the Madison, Wisconsin mayor was visiting us and I believe the, uh, the mayor, as a councillor then, perhaps attended that meeting, and, and I believe that Councillor Shell did as well. And it was a really interesting presentation. And what he said, uh, I remember quite clearly. First of all, he said, when they initially proposed bike boulevards in Madison, in the core of the city, where the university district is, he said there was a little bit of pushback. And he said, the only problem now is that everybody wants their street to be a bike boulevard. And the reason he said that was he said that bike boulevards are like traffic calming on steroids. That everybody recognizes you lower the speed, in that case, to 20 miles an hour. In the case of bike boulevards in Kingston, probably 30 kilometers an hour would be reasonable. You still allow parking on both sides of the street. You put sharrows, you put, emblem, uh, they share the road emblems down. And in the States, they say something we probably couldn't do in signage here, which is please yield to cyclists. But what we could do here is say, please share the road at the beginning and the ending of the entrance and exits on bike boulevards. And I think uh, it would be clearly uh, embraced by the community. And I know that any of these green streets that have been identified could work. The only reason I was suggesting Frontenac Street was because uh, we already will be moving ahead with making it more of a green street. Uh, there's a logical uh, connection between Memorial Center, Victoria Park, and KCVI, and main campus. And so that would enable uh, that to be an excellent place to pilot. Uh, bike boulevards. So uh, it's not a radical new idea. Saskatoon, Vancouver, Lethbridge, and other Canadian cities already have it. Uh, Portland, Oregon, Madison, Wisconsin, Seattle, Tucson, and quite a few other. Palo Alto was the first community to pilot and have bike boulevards. So it's a tried and true uh, approach to traffic calming and creating safe, uh, safe transit ways for pedestrians and, and uh, cyclists. So I hope that, uh, and just a quick reminder, this is worded in that wonderful way that is asking staff to consider it and bring it back through our consultative process of it coming through EITP and then on to council. So it, I'm not trying to be a traffic engineer here. I'm just trying to share what I think would be an excellent idea with our very capable traffic engineers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a question for um, staff on the second Part, I guess second whereas clause. So the streets that are named, um, some of them extend, of course, 
beyond Princess Street and into the King's Court area. Just curious if there's anything in this wording that would preclude the development of a bike boulevard that went along the entire street, let's say for Alfred Street, for example. Mr. Van Buren. Um, I, I think the approach that we would take, uh, assuming that council is gonna support uh, the, um, the motion that's in front of them this evening is that we would, we would have a more comprehensive look at this. Um, I think the streets that are identified here are the right ones. It kind of encapsulates that kind of sub-geographical area of the, uh, the Williamsville district and maybe even touches in some part on the, uh, the Kings Court area. Um, but I think you know, our intent would be to look at what's being described in this, uh, in this motion and have a little bit more of a comprehensive look in terms of what the possible recommendations could be. I think it's it's obvious that Frontenac Street may be a leading contender for the bike boulevard, but I think we would also look at some of the adjoining streets as well. Councilor Stroud. Thanks for that response, Mr. Van Buren, because uh, this is the kind of thing that staff could bring to EITP and we could have a discussion there, we hear from members of the public. Uh, I don't know which street might be the best, but i just point out that uh, Frontenac is the shortest of those th three streets, and the other two, Albert and Alfred, both extend also into Sydenham District as well as uh, Kings Court. And I plan to support this. I'm very excited about seeing the report from staff. Thank you. So we will call the vote on new motion number three. Can I make just one quick final comment yes. as the mover? Um, in other cities, it was always piloted somewhere first, and the demand definitely expanded to others. And I would, without a doubt, support a reasonable request in any district in the city where the criteria that will be established by, for what a bike boulevard should be by our traffic engineers, I would support that in any, in any district across the city. So, thank you. Okay, so we will call the vote on new motion number three. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, ask for minutes, please. So, it's. Councillor Neal? Yes. Notice uh, of motion? A notice of motion. I'm glad that the clerks put it up on the screen because I can't find it here. Uh, this is moved by myself, seconded by Councillor George, whereas the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, AMO, has written a thorough position paper on the Minister's expert panel report on public health and does not support the recommendations of the report. And whereas KFLNA Public Health Board and the Ontario Public Health Organization, Alpha, have both endorsed the AMO response to the Minister's Expert Panel Report. Therefore, be it resolved that the City of Kingston also strongly endorses the AMO position and requests that the Minister review the criticisms of AMO and Alpha, thoroughly addresses them before implementing any recommendations, and that this motion be shared with MPP Sophie Koala, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, Dr. Eric Hoskins, Premier Kathleen Wynne, Opposition Leaders Patrick Brown and Andrea Horvath, AMO Alpha, KFLNA Public Health, and all Ontario municipalities with populations over 40,000. Okay, thank you very much. On to minutes. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2017-23, held Tuesday, October 17th, 2017, be confirmed. Please vote. And that carries. We have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? 
Mr. Clerk, I'll ask for bylaws, please. Okay, we do have a number of separations uh, tonight. Councillor Stroud, you're, sorry, Councillor McLaren, you're excused for the first vote. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaw one be given its first and second reading. Please vote. And that carries. Councillor McLaren, you can return. Councillor George, you're excused for the next two bylaw votes. Councillor Cannon for the next four. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaw 14 be given its first and second reading. Please vote. One more, please. That carries. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaw 14 be given its third reading. Please vote. Councillor George, you can return. Carries. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaws 15 through 19 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaws 15 through 19 be given their third reading. Please vote. That carries. Councillor Candon, you can return, please. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that bylaws 2 through 13 and 20 through 22 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw Number 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaws 11 to 13 three readings. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Holland, that Bylaws 11 through 13 and 20 through 22 be given their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Candid, seconded by Councillor Boehm. Please vote. And that carries. Thank you very much.